Okay, good morning, Carroll County. Commissioner Ed Rothstein, it is February, Tuesday, February 23rd. I believe we have a full agenda for this morning, and then we'll be going into closed, and then we uh, come back together on Thursday for open session. As we always do, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and uh, a moment of silence reminding us about the 500,000 plus that have now died for COVID-19 or from COVID-19. Our uh, flags are at half staff through Friday, reminding us of the uh, challenges that we still are living in, uh, giving um, strength and courage to those serving uh, on the front line, those healthcare workers, and uh, keeping all those in uh, in our hearts and prayers. Thanks. Stan. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, it's uh, for me a little hard to start after reminding us a half a million plus folks have already died from this. Uh, Carroll County is not an island and uh, we're gonna go into priority Carroll. I'm just gonna start with sharing what's on my mind that I believe is a priority for Carroll County. And that is we are not an island and uh, we are not alone. We are going through this pandemic there is a light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccines and let's keep, uh, you know, wishing that the Johnson and Johnson vaccine will get put in place. Um, and kudos and strength to our healthcare providers. Again, who are providing the vaccines. Um, you know, like the, uh, like the opera, uh, the fat lady has not sung. So we shouldn't be leaving the, uh, the theater right now. We shouldn't be abandoning the due diligence or wearing the masks or keeping safe distance or washing our hands. We should continue to look at the community and our neighbors. This has nothing to do with politics. It has everything to do with the community. So I applaud all those that continue to wear our masks and uh, keeping safe distance. I applaud all those looking out for our community and our neighbors, and we should not shy away from that. Uh, and if the paper can pick up anything from today, I think that needs to be a continuing message that we will not, um, you know, uh, slow ourselves down in watching out for our community and our neighbors. Um, it's not time to leave the theater. This pandemic is still with us. Um, I did mention the vaccines. Uh, <clears throat> I do talk with the state along with many of us, uh, talk with the state on the uh, vaccine program I am still not convinced that it is in Carroll County's best interest the way it's being distributed uh, as far as the vaccines because they are continuing to use the regional centers and uh, pharmacies, which uh, are good things, but they're not as good for those that are vulnerable and getting sick. In other words, the over 75 and those that we have put also on the front lines are educators in our schools um, that need to be vaccinated as we continue to strive in opening our schools. Um, so keep looking out for our community and neighbors, make sure that they're signed up uh, to get vaccinated. We will do our best in uh, getting more and more vaccines uh, in place here in Carroll County. Bottom line is we're leaders, we gotta lead by example. And leading by example is wearing a mask, leading by example is doing what's right in taking care of our community. So. I will leave it at that for my priority here in Carroll County. Uh, Commissioner Frazier. <laughs> Again, when you follow Commissioner Rothstein, there's not much left to say. <laughs> I'll say that uh, while the numbers are going in the right direction, and they are, we certainly hope that they keep going that way, but still have to be vigilant. And everything Commissioner Rothstein said, I, 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 I agree with completely. Keep masks, washing, distance, all that stuff. We still need to do it. It's not over yet. I'm hoping it will be soon, but it's not over yet. And in that vein, I, I, I still haven't seen or heard anything from the Board of Ed about their plan 
I'm going to go back into school. I was hoping to have heard something by now, but we haven't. I, I'm thinking Wednesday they'll, at their meeting, they're going to talk about this and they'll have a plan worked out because what worries me about it is we went to cohort A and cohort B because you couldn't have all the kids in school at one time because of social distancing. But now they're asking all the kids to come back in school at one time and we're still, still supposed to be social distancing. So I can't wait to see the plan. I'm hoping it's going to work out well because as a retired teacher of over 40 years experience, nothing beats in-person <clears> learning. <throat> I love to have the kids in there, but I want it done safely. Thank you. That's all I have. Absolutely. Commissioner Boucher. Thank you, President Rolstein. And I appreciate you mentioning the uh, 75 plus population. Those are the ones that seem to be the most vulnerable in the hospitals and the fatalities. So that's a focus of us. I want to thank Mr. Swam and Bonnie Staub in her tourism department for bringing this information up on African American Heritage Month. Commissioner Wance had mentioned this earlier in the month and I said that we had different brochures. Well, here's the brochures and you can go online and get this information. I really like the tours. I'm very much particularly uh, partial to the Civil War veterans. We have numerous African American troops who served in Carroll County who are buried throughout the county. You can go online, you can find all these different locations to go on a tour. Uh, I believe Commissioner Wance also mentioned Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tugman. There are wonderful facilities on the Eastern Shore you can get a tour. Two of the biggest leaders and advocates of the abolition of slavery came out of the state of Maryland. A lot of people don't realize that. And the federal government, the state government invested a substantial amount of money in recording that history and having the facilities you can go tour and get a better understanding of the struggle that African Americans face in not only the state of Maryland, but throughout the state. So I appreciate them for getting this information together. The month's almost over, but please remember to be aware of these facilities and museums throughout the year. And down in Sykesville, they had the one uh, room schoolhouse. You know, history can be ugly, but history can be learned from. So please take the time to go on these tours and have recognition for what we face as a society. And uh, here we go. I went on a stormwater management tour this week with uh, uh, Euro uh, Chief uh, Chris Hines, and thanks to the director, Tom Devilvis, for taking me out. This is Sullivan Road. I was not aware of how large the stormwater management facility is in Westminster on Sullivan Road. It's absolutely gorgeous. Even during the winter, there's beauty in the winter, and I'm grateful for him taking me out there and educating me on this. You know, it's fascinating to see all the runoff going into these storm facilities and nice clean water coming out the other end. We did the Sullivan Road in Westminster, and I believe this one here, Chris, is at the new, yeah, there is New Windsor yeah. Pond Stormwater Management. That was neat. While we are out there, a whole herd of deer came running through, and there was lots of tracks around, even bunny rabbits. So these stormwater management facilities also offer a water source to wildlife, and the grass is kept up, so it's healthy grass for them to eat. If I could hunt them, I'd hunt them, but it, they're enjoying it very much. And New Windsor had a neat facility as well. New Windsor and Mount Airy both had very nice facilities. I was honored to go out and get uh, a tour of what's taking place out there because we as a commission board invest a lot of capital into these projects. So to go out there and be educated on what they're doing and ultimately it impacts water quality throughout the, the state, especially at Chesapeake Bay. You know, I love fishing, hunting, I love oysters, I love crabbing as many of you do. And all that is an accumulation of quality from the projects that we institute locally along with other counties. So I want to thank the uh, Land and Resource Management Bureau for giving me this tour and allowing us to show this to the public to see what we're doing to help create water quality in the county. So thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Commissioner Boucher. Commissioner uh, Weaver. Yes. Um, first of all, uh, uh, you said it all, I think, with the beginning here. This, uh, we're not out of this yet. We still have to remain vigilant that we wear face masks, wash our hands, keep our distance. And um, this will, uh, spring comes on, people uh, think, you know, well, we're going to have, it's going away. We have the vaccines. Yes, we're fighting it. It's happening, but it's almost been a year now. But that two-week period, we were going to get into this, and that two weeks has turned into 50 weeks. So uh, just remain uh, 
stay the course is what I'm going to just say on this one so we can get through this. Uh, Dennis, you mentioned the uh, school plan. It's a 60-page document right now. It'll be uh, given out tomorrow night, uh, gone through uh, at the meeting uh, on their plan for uh, opening schools uh, here in Carroll County. So it should be interesting. Uh, make some light reading uh, if you uh, <laughs> have the time. Uh, on the other note here, um, this is National FFA Week, and we've always traditionally given a proclamation this week. Schools are in session. We always had people in. Uh, however, uh, that's not going to happen this year. It's a little different uh, uh, program. But this began in 1948, um, and, uh, and it was uh, to let people know that George Washington's legacy was that of an agriculturalist and farmer, and he is one of the uh, uh, <clears throat> people that the uh, FFA really looked up to as far as the way he uh, was uh, balanced his budget and the way he was uh, a leader in this country. So uh, just to uh, shout out to the uh, people involved in that, I uh, and well, everybody is if they eat. Uh, so I just want to uh, have a shout out that this is National FFA Week, and as you eat your next meal, thank somebody who helped uh, get it to your plate for you. So uh, thank you, and uh, have a good week. Thanks, Commissioner Weaver. Commissioner Wance. Good morning, everybody. The, the, I, had to, I had to close the blinds in here because the sun's so bright. Isn't that a good thing? <laughs> I think maybe spring has sprung, and I need to apologize to the groundhog who I called stupid about five weeks ago. Hopefully, we're in the sixth week now, and my apologies to the groundhog. Um, on that note, I'd like to uh, give a shout out to everybody that's been out working in the elements. We've had several very challenging storms over the last several weeks. Uh, not only our folks uh, in DPW, and the guys and gals that are behind the steering wheels of the trucks, uh, but our, our law enforcement partners uh, have done an excellent job uh, making sure that, that they watch over us at, out there and our first responders, our volunteer fire companies, uh, several incidents during some of these uh, height, heights of some of the storms. And uh, they were, were instrumental in, uh, in uh, bringing those to an end. So. A huge thank, uh, thank you to everybody in, in, uh, that's been out in, in these elements. Uh, on that note, public safety-wise, there have been 11 fire deaths in the state of Maryland to this point. But let that sink in a little bit. 11 in the state of Maryland. Uh, that is a very tragic number. The latest was in Hagerstown. Uh, so it, it, we, we need to be forever mindful of public safety and 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 make sure that we're doing the best things there because um, you know at any given time uh, you could have a, a serious incident. Uh, we saw what happened in Texas uh, with with the storm that hit down there, and uh, you know you just you just never know. So on that note, I want to give a shout out to our emergency management folks too. They were on top of the uh, all of the forecasts. They pretty much hit them right on the head. Uh, we knew that yesterday was going to be a challenge because of the time period that it hit. Um, a good call from the folks here to get everybody in early if they had to, because I got a my phone went off and said at 7:57 a.m. we begin seeing snow in Westminster. Well, guess what time we began seeing snow in Westminster? 7:57 a.m. It's pretty pretty remarkable how you can do that. So. Um, I think that's all that I have right now. Uh, I will echo uh, Commissioner Rostein uh, with everything COVID. Uh, I, I still don't get the fact that the state continues uh, to want to put all of the eggs in the baskets of the mass vaccination sites. I've got a huge problem with that. I've been a huge supporter of Governor Hogan and his team. Uh, this one doesn't make any sense to me. Our local health departments, that's where it needs to be done. So I'm hopeful. Uh, listen, uh, I know Commissioner Rothstein has been has been working hard on that, as, as well as, as Ed Singer and everybody. Um, we haven't gotten anywhere with that, and I don't think that we will. But appreciate your efforts anyway. 
uh, and we'll continue to hopefully get uh, an uptick in vaccines here so we can get more shots in the arms. So uh, I think that's all that I've got right now. And uh, again, I think it's supposed to be 54 degrees tomorrow. Get out and enjoy. Yep, I think so. And uh, hopefully you did not jinx us. Uh, Second <laughs> spring's coming early, so knock on wood that it will be. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, I do think it's going to be in the 40s and 50s, so it'll be nice. Um, and I do applaud the uh, the team, the DPW, and all the folks in making the decisions and getting the word out, the communications, uh, getting the word out. Yesterday was tough because, you know, we're used to saying things are delayed or closed. We're not used to saying, please come in early, you know. So, but uh, we did our best in doing that, and a lot of the employees and workforce uh, – listened and took advantage of that and uh, came in early to beat the uh, snow that came down. Um, the last little factoid, uh, Mount Suribachi on February 23rd is the day the flag was risen in Iwo Jima. Um, so another just marker on how important it is to recognize who we are and what we stand for. Um, just thought about that. State directives, we talked about the vaccine. We're uh, continuing to work with uh, Secretary Schrader and uh, Steve Hsu and the entire team in trying to figure out what the right mix is uh, for the vaccines. Uh, working with our legislator, legislative body, excuse me, on uh, highlighting the need to get the numbers. Um, right now, over the next four weeks, we should expect a thousand doses uh, a week um, being distributed into our health department. Uh, priority still remains is 1B, which is 75 and over, and then also our education system um, and anything left over for continuation of government. Um, but we are not in 1C. It does not mean do not register uh, for 1C, but this is the distribution of, uh, of vaccines right now. Also in partnership with LifeBridge, they're, they're just rock stars over there from the head of LifeBridge Carroll Hospital to uh, Leslie Simmons and Dr. Meltzer. Um, they are uh, started their remote or travel uh, vaccination program, um, getting to houses and to uh, places where people are uh, to getting them vaccine or uh, vaccinated. So I really do applaud them uh, being part of our team. Other state directives, um, anything from MACO, uh, Commissioner Wance or Commissioner Frazier, can you think of? No. Commissioner uh, Wentz? No, no uh, nothing. Mako has been a little quiet lately because we're, we're getting towards the end of being of bills being introduced. We'll hear from Mike here, but uh, nothing as far as COVID is concerned. I know that they also tried their their best to get the word out that the, the vaccines belong in the local health departments, and they also uh, didn't get very far. So uh, that's all that we had from there. Yeah, and... Uh, Thursday, we will get an update from our health department. Um, I don't believe they're on today. Uh, we were given the information on Thursday. Um, the numbers seem to be in a, a small downtick, but the priority still remains, uh, as I mentioned, and that is vaccinating those most vulnerable in the 1A and 1B um, priorities. So let's jump and, right into uh hey, Ed, Ed, yeah, real, real quick, I do know that the governor is having a press conference this afternoon at 2.30 uh, to update uh, COVID, uh, give COVID updates or what have you. So uh, must see TV at 2.30 this afternoon. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's jump right into uh, Mr. Fowler. Mike, I expect you're on. Yes. Good morning, Commissioner. Good, good to morning. see you all. Sunshine is always a good thing, especially this time of year. So by the end of the week, we'll be halfway through this session, at least halfway through. Uh, the number of bills, as Commissioner Wance mentioned, uh, we've pretty much seen the introduction. There'll be a few stragglers here and there coming out of the Rules Committee, but uh, by and large, we're just sitting around 2,300 bills right now, which is substantially fewer than, than a typical session, which sounds like some of the, some of the legislators listen to their leadership when they were uh, told to minimize the number of bills. Uh, so the next, I think, big date 
that we're we're eyeing is a uh, crossover, which is March 22nd. That's when the bills have to be in in opposite chambers. So we'll know what bills have life and uh, and what bills don't. Um, the only constitutional obligation the legislature has is to pass a budget, and they have to do that by the uh, 5th of April, and then signy die would be on the 12th. So I uh, don't think we'll see any confetti or balloons this year like, like we did last year, but uh, nonetheless, we're, we've got our eyes on that date. So the governor's uh, vetoes were overridden, uh, which include the blueprint for Maryland's future, the Kerwin bill and uh, the digital tax bill. Uh, the Kerwin bill for the most part will remain unchanged. There may be some technical uh, matters in there that need to be addressed, but for the most part that, that sails through as it was passed uh, last session. Uh, the governor's budget, the uh, the Burfa bill, I think we've talked about some of the challenges to the counties that we see in there. Uh, they, they continue to remain. The shift of SDAT funding right now, there's a 50-50 split. Uh, the governor in, 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 in past sessions, as he has in this session, is attempting to shift those costs to the county that will be uh, proposing 90% by 2026. Um, and you've heard all the, the reasons why that's such a bad idea, mainly that they're not our employees. Uh, another interesting one is to ask the counties to bear 50% of the costs of erroneous incarceration settlements. Uh, the hold harmless grants for education and the impact on on MOE um, is likely to be addressed by DLS in an, in an amendment uh, to the BRFA. And uh, funding cuts of 10% to our local management boards remain in there, and that would uh, then rebase the future funding on that cut. Uh, the subcommittee hearing was last, uh, subcommittee's hearing uh, was last week. That was a joint uh, hearing Senate and, and House subcommittees. Uh, the local management boards made their case uh, to the subcommittees. Um, and so we'll be watching that as they uh, as they continue to work on the budget. And then of course the changes to the Cade formula for community colleges, uh, a similar uh, cut uh, in last year's or similar proposed on last year's BRFA would have cut overall funding to community colleges by approximately 100 million in 2025. So uh, a lot of focus on the challenges to community colleges. The governor's relief bill uh, did pass through both chambers. Uh, there was a, a minor hang up uh, regarding making available uh, to both uh, documented and undocumented immigrants, the benefits of the bill. Uh, they decided to, to uh, end the discussion on that, pass the bill as it was proposed. It was signed and made effective immediately. Uh, the legislature, the Democratic caucus, uh, said that they would uh, introduce a separate bill to deal with the, uh, the immigrant issue and uh, the unemployment insurance tax impact re remains, but it really is unclear. Um, I've, I've given you some numbers which were initial DLS estimates, but no one really has a handle on what that means. Uh, many of the people that are getting these unemployment uh, benefits probably or, or may not have paid taxes uh, to begin with. So when you talk about the impact, it's, it's very difficult to calculate right now. So uh, we'll, we'll just, again, have to see how that develops. Uh, in the business and taxes category, so a number of COVID presumption bills, these are workman's comp that would presume that anyone contracting uh, COVID-19 did so in the workplace, much as there are presumptive diseases, occupational uh, diseases. As you can see, there are quite a few of those. Um, the House hearings will begin next week and, uh, and the Senate hearings will follow 
the following week. There's also a workman's comp bill on medical cannabis. Uh, the injury would be covered under workman's comp if it's the result of effects, if, if the result is the effects of a prescribed medical cannabis. So the individual would have to have the certificate that the state issues. The counties are concerned about this. Any of these cannabis bills uh, uh, bring some concerns forward about the conflict between federal law and state law. Federal law, it's still illegal. And so they are concerned about the, uh, their ability to continue to receive federal funding. Proposal HP uh, 1079 would prohibit the collection of admissions and amusement tax for recreational facilities. So think about gyms. Um, I know there's a, a proposal to, to uh, construct a, a pretty significant recreational facility in the county. Uh, those are the kinds of things that will be impacted by that. That hearing was last week, no movement on the bill yet. Uh, we've talked about this one before, Senate Bill 710, the teleworking bill uh, requires teleworking to the extent practicable and requires each entity, both uh, public sector and private sector, to uh, submit an annual report to the Senate Budget and Tax Committee on compliance with the plan. Uh, I mentioned to you this sponsor has, uh, has admitted this is a uh, traffic bill more so than a, a teleworking bill. Uh, so that, that's been heard, but again, no movement on that. Uh, House Bill 581 and Senate Bill 496 for the Maryland Essential Workers Protection Act. Very, very broad. Uh, I think I mentioned six pages of, uh, of identified essential workers. This is still in the respective committees. Um, the, the House uh, Committee Chair opened his hearing by saying this was a starting point. Um, not a starting point to build on, but a starting point, I think, is throw everything in the pot and let's see how much we can get through. Uh, on the Senate side, the sponsor admitted in the hearing that uh, the bill needed a lot of work um, and he was open to changing it. So I think if the bill does move, I think you'll see it significantly uh, reduced in comparison to its its current impact, but we'll be keeping an eye on that, obviously. Uh, House Bill 583 and Senate Bill 414, that's the Climate Solutions uh, Now Act. The um, uh, heavily amended version has passed committee in the Senate on a party line vote, and it now goes to budget and tax because it was a bill that was jointly uh, assigned. The, the House bill had its hearing, but it has not moved. I suspect uh, a lot of that will depend on what the Senate sends over. Uh, House Bill 472 was the uh, prohibition on the use of glyphosate. Uh, that's received an unfavorable report in committee. Uh, there were a lot of concerns from the agricultural community and the, uh, the chemical is used, uh, although sparingly, uh, by local governments and their vegetation management programs. House Bill 103 and Senate Bill 90. Uh, the Senate version has been withdrawn. That's a good thing. Uh, that was a bill that would um, have, have codified, in, in my opinion, a, a limited local involvement in the CPCM process, uh, particularly as it, as it relates to uh, solar facilities. Uh, you remember the, the suit and uh, the issue of how much involvement you can have in the CPCN process. Uh, the state has the authority there. Uh, the uh, Public Service Commission must consider your concerns. This would have limited your, uh, your involvement to simply a letter stating your position. So that has essentially uh, fallen by the wayside. The election bills, we've, we've talked about the specific of those, early voting centers, uh, post-election tabulation audits, a very expensive proposition, polling places at continuing care retirement communities, which we've seen in the past, and accessibility for voters with disabilities, where we need to, uh, we would be required to uh, have these, uh, these particular uh, 
uh, ballot marking devices for all voters. Uh, these were heard last week. I'm coming to you a couple of days late, so this was last week, um, and we're still following those. So they haven't moved in, in committees yet either. Uh, the Senate Bill 361 would create a statewide 311 system, uh, which is a good thing. That hearing was last week. Um, so we'll be following that bill uh, that's being supported by, by MACO and by the counties collectively. Uh, Senate Bill 645 was the 911 board procurement reform. Uh, MACO has been successful in getting that bill amended to be now just a, uh, a report. Uh, the original bill would have subjected uh, our contracts to a, an additional review by the state and would have delayed them significantly. Uh, now that the bill has been amended to just be a collective report, the, the contracts will simply be sent to the state. The state will review and issue a report. The expectation is that report will show that the counties are conducting these, uh, these uh, contract negotiations uh, at, according to the rules. So. That was a good thing. Uh, police reform continues to be a, uh, a big subject of headlines in the press. Uh, there are numerous bills in play, which include the speaker's bill. Uh, you will remember we submitted a letter of information that discussed some of the, uh, the issues that particularly uh, local governments, uh, commission governments that have a, an elected sheriff have. Um, the, the senator's bill uh, Senate Bill uh, 627 was uh, a, a repeal of the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights uh, and a replacement with a prescribed disciplinary process, which would be essentially uh, driven by the, the chiefs of the forces. Uh, a heavily amended yeah, version of that was voted out of, um, out of judicial uh, proceedings. The senator's very upset with the uh, with the way the bill was amended. Uh, it, it's limited to offer discipline and there are no local government mandates in, in that bill that offers the counties the opportunity to become involved in the process, but is not an obligation. Uh, body cameras continue to be a uh, subject there. They are, uh, body cameras are included in the speaker's bill, but there are also several individual bills addressing those. And I believe the the, the sheriff will have more to say on that a little bit later. Um, and then House Bill 120 and Senate Bill 178 would um, would exclude disciplinary issues from personnel records classification. So right now they're, they're considered um, personnel issues and not discoverable. Uh, this bill would change that. Um, amended version has passed. Uh, why on your on your notes I have uh, education, health, environmental affairs. Obviously, it's judicial proceedings. Uh, uh, hearing those bills, uh, the SRO related bills. Uh, there are, are several of those. They range from uh, limiting the ways in which the SRO can interact in the school to completely removing the funding from the program and diverting. Uh, so no movement on those yet. I think these, these uh, uh, police bills, we'll see them, uh, I think you'll see them change in certain ways, maybe be included in a larger omnibus type bill or, or come through separately, but a lot of different ideas and have to be hashed out uh, on those bills. Uh, House Bill 851, this is uh, a bill that would limit inmate stays in restrictive housings to 15 days. So these are, are people with serious uh, mental illness issues. The problem is there uh, is no availability in the appropriate state facilities. That's really the answer to this. Um, and this would uh, put requirements on the local jails to provide uh, housing for these type of inmates, uh, which is very challenging. So that had had its hearing last week. Uh, House Bill 1123 and Senate Bill 563 are the MAKO initiative for uh, funding local health departments. Uh, they've been heard and we'll, we'll be watching those. Uh, 
uh, cannabis legislation. So House Bill 32 would uh, legalize uh, cannabis in Maryland. Um, that was heard on the 16th, but it has not moved uh, as of this reading. Um, and Senate Bill 708, the uh, Senate version, that's scheduled for uh, next week. Both of these bills set up a regulation regime, regime and a tax regime. Uh, for Senate Bill 708, uh, a county or a municipality may opt out of this program. Uh, but if they opt out, they will not be eligible to receive revenue from, uh, from the sale. Uh, public Works and Transportation. So uh, House Bill 1094 and Senate Bill 650, uh, that's a work group to evaluate the establishment of a regional waste disposal facility. Uh, so this would uh, be a bill that affects um, all of the counties that are currently members of the Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal Authority with the exception of Frederick County and uh, Montgomery County. So it'd be Baltimore, Baltimore City, uh, Carroll, Howard Anne Arundel, um, and Harford counties. The bill was submitted at the request of Baltimore County Administration. Uh, interestingly, the affected counties were not really contacted in advance of this. Uh, it sets out uh, conditions for a work group to be formed uh, with a, a set of prescribed um, issues for an outcome. So for example, facility siting, uh, the costs associated. Um, and it commits, the language seems to commit the affected parties to whatever conclusions the work group uh, reaches. Uh, so I know that uh, Commissioner Wentz may have some more to say on this, but um, this is a this is a bill that's probably not very good for us, and uh, and so it's being heard today. Um, we have not taken a formal position on it, but uh, but we're going to watch it closely. Yeah, if I could chime in real quick on that, Mike, just to let I, I think Commissioner Rostein knows I cc'd him on a correspondence that I sent to. Uh, uh, Johnny Olszewski's office, office yesterday morning. Uh, that that's that sort of that gives you an idea of the limitations that we have this year with this session because you've got to be signed up or give written testimony two days prior to a bill being heard. It's not like it used to be when you can walk in down there and and meet folks face to face. Uh, but they had reached out to us to see if we would help would support that bill. Uh, so I immediately engaged Mike and uh, he he. Uh, did what he does best and honestly uh, as he said our folks didn't know anything about it no one was contacted about this bill so that troubles me um, and it also troubles me that they want to try to do something uh, legislatively that I believe the county should be working around the table to do and not hearing from the folks that really don't know what with all due respect, they have no idea uh, what the challenges are with waste disposal. You know, the very fact that, that Montgomery County wasn't included in the bill is, is crazy because right now, County Executive Elridge is struggling with what he has no place to put a landfill anymore. So he's struggling, and yet they've been, they, they weren't a part of this. So I think it was thrown together real quick by somebody. It may have good intentions, and I hope that it does. But I hope that it 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 turns and lets the counties all sit around the table with their respective staffs that know best again to get it to get to a good place here with waste disposal. So, Mike, I appreciate your work on that. I I kind of got you at last minute. You you uh, you stepped up and we got uh, good information, and I I passed that on to County Executive uh, Olszewski's office. So we'll see where it goes. Thanks. Yeah, well, you, you've got great people working on the issue. They were fully up to speed on it, so it was easy. Just pick up the phone and find out what's going on. So interestingly, though, there is a, a bill that's somewhat similar in nature, House Bill 1103 uh, by uh, Delegate Weibel from Allegheny County, which would create a task force to study recycling and processing of solid waste in a statewide bill. 
So it takes a similar approach, but it's statewide. Um, it does include the study of some technologies that are specifically prohibited in the, uh, in the more local bill, in the Baltimore County bill. Uh, for instance, waste to energy is precluded um, in, in the Baltimore County bill. Uh, but the, the larger statewide bill takes a more holistic approach. So that might be something that, that makes a little bit more um, sense and, uh, and we may be able to get behind on that. Um, and, and last day, our public facilities bond bill was heard uh, in Senate committee last week, and it'll be in the House committee on Thursday. So I just weighed in very quickly uh, to say we we hopeful hopeful for a favorable report, which I really have no concerns that we won't. Um, and just a, a, a note, quick note on redistricting. So apparently, the census data will be delayed until uh, the end of September. So basically you're not gonna have the information until October, uh, which means the proposal from the governor uh, to create a new map is, is unlikely in 2021. Uh, so that'll start to, to jam up the process a little bit. Um, so that's, that's where we are today. And uh, I'll be, uh, tied to the to the hearing schedule for the balance of this session. Hey, Mike, thanks. And uh, again, like uh, Commissioner Wentz shared, thank you for all you're doing, uh, keeping a pulse on uh, the activity happening in uh, in Annapolis and then also uh, those other pieces like the one you just talked about coming out of Baltimore County um, as a proposal. Uh, are there any questions, comments from the team? On what was shared. A quick question, Mike, and I probably should know the answer to this. The two cannabis bills, 32 and 708, has, um, has law enforcement, and this is probably a good segue here, has law enforcement <laughs> weighed in on on uh, these two bills or have we not, or they are, or are they not to that point yet? And I see, I see the sheriff is maybe lighting up here. Uh, <laughs> You know, most of the, like, pun intended, lighting up. Had, like, see what I did there? Um, uh, Unfortunately, yes. Yeah, well, you know. So I, <laughs> I'm Johnny on the spot, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, there's that. Um, but maybe your take, Jim, at, from your colleagues, what, where are you guys on these two bills? So the cannabis bill, is that what you're? Yeah, yeah, thir yeah. House Bill Thirty Two and Senate Bill Seven Hundred Eight. They're both the cannabis. Um... Like you guys, I, I'm, and, and I think the state's attorney will be on soon. We all belong to associations, so you guys have Mako that that represents a larger body of the of the counties, and and I also participate in the Maryland Sheriffs Association, and we we submit you know our stance on different legislation, and um, and I have a personal stance on that, and when it comes to to recreational marijuana, I just simply, I, I just can't get behind it. Um, uh, but when it starts to affect, there are, there is legislation for the police training commission to um, allow uh, individuals to, uh, that, that are processing to be law enforcement officers or correctional deputies to um, have medical marijuana uh, cards and, and uh, um, there's no limited usage of marijuana that, uh, that allows me to, to disclude them from hiring. So. Um, just, just philosophically, and then as association, we're against it. I mean, when you start bringing in mind-altering drugs to, and, and the ability to, to operate as a police officer carrying a gun, driving a car, um, and and uh, I, I just don't think that that uh, uh, you should have that in your system, and it stays in your system for days. So if one of my deputies is involved in something, uh, a crash or something like that, and there's civil litigation and, and blood tests, and there's just so many things that come into play when you're when you're uh, a police officer. We just just don't agree with it. Okay, thanks. I, you know, we were under the impression, Mike, that these bills wouldn't rear their their ugly heads uh, in this session, but I guess because of budgetary constraints and what have you, it seems like they're being pushed. It, it, it is that. Is that where we are? And where have they either of those been heard? Uh, the, the, the one has the Senate bill uh, will be next week. The House bill has been heard. Uh, yeah, I think you could argue that they're primarily revenue bills. 
Um, there are some advocates that are, uh, I think, looking at it from a decriminalization uh, perspective, um, that it will impact certain communities, uh, you know, in a favorable way. Uh, some of the challenges, I think, from a physiological perspective, it's it's much more difficult to address than alcohol. You know, uh, the effects of it are just not, I think, as predictable uh, or as well understood as as alcohol. So, um, I, I I wasn't sure really whether this was going to be put forward in a bill or whether it would go to referendum. I think the thought was always we, we needed some direction from the electorate first. Uh, and as you know, there are, there are some pretty significant issues this session. And this one seems uh, to me, uh, as my personal opinion, a little bit outside of, of what the, the focus of the General Assembly is and and maybe should be this session. So I'm not so sure they'll go forward. They're pretty big bills um, in, in terms of, you know, how prescriptive they are and, and what they do and what they're setting up. So I, I would be surprised if they pass, but don't, don't hold me to that. And maybe I'll have a little bit more specific guidance for you next week. Okay, thanks. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate your your uh, your opinion on that too, Sheriff. Thanks. Okay. Anything else for Mike for the good of the group? Okay, Mike. I would again appreciate all the work you're doing. I think at this time, uh, Sheriff, you're st uh, still lit up, and we're gonna you're gonna be joined by uh, Chief Ledwell, and I think uh, Mr. D. Leonardo, if he's on. Don't know if he is yet or not. And we're going to get a uh, briefing on John. the body. Okay. Oh, there you are, man. Uh, briefing on the law enforcement body worn camera project. So the three of you, whoever wants to start, have at it. So um, this kind of how we'll go through the presentation is I, I have a presentation for you, a PowerPoint, uh, kind of from the law enforcement side. And then the state's attorney will kind of come in and say, this is what the effects of this program are on his side, and then Chief Ludwell's on because uh, he's the largest municipality in the county, and he can do this a little differently than, than I'm gonna be able to do it, and he's gonna actually do it, I believe, uh, soon. So uh, he'll give his perspective on how the body-worn camera system works within his organization. So just so you guys understand, my, I have a representative for all legislative issues from the Sheriff's Office, Major Chuck Rapp, sits on a committee with, with the Sheriff's Association. He does speak with Mike Bauer periodically on, on things that uh, affect Carroll County and law enforcement. And um, those two go kind of way back from, from Baltimore County days. So uh, it's good relationship so that we can communicate with him. And I do have a number of stances on the legislation that's, that's coming through Annapolis. The SRO program, I think you guys know where I stand with that. Uh, the irony with the SRO program is that you got to go through metal detectors and you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a cop in Annapolis. Um, and there's always a state trooper or two sitting in a hearing room. So the protection's okay for them, but it's not okay for, for our kids in school. And I think overwhelmingly in this county, if you polled folks, that program shouldn't go anywhere. It's very popular. And ironically, if you polled the people in the counties where the delegates and senators are against it, um, it's blatantly obvious that they're not in touch with their constituency because their constituency would also say overwhelmingly that SROs work in their schools and they should remain. So I'm going to try and share a screen of first time doing it on, on teams of a PowerPoint uh, that, that we put together. I'll go through the PowerPoint. If you guys got any questions along the way, just ask. Uh, and then I'll switch over to the state's attorney and let him do his presentation. There's a lot of information with body worn cameras. There's a lot of, uh, uh, issues when it comes to uh, uh, space that you guys have with hardware, with uh, personnel, and I'm going to try and answer it as best that I can. Um, and and this is just merely a briefing, and, and then we can discuss where you guys might want to go or some follow-up questions at the end. So um, let me go ahead and share 
my PowerPoint screen. Do you guys see that okay? We do. Yep, we got it. Okay. Let me try and move this around so I can get the presentation going. So what I'm going to do is, uh, it's a little slow, so give it a second to, to go ahead and jump on. So what I'll do is, is kind of brief you on th in three different manners, so or four different ways. So the current legislation that's going through the House, uh, the hardware and equipment needs, personnel and, and office space. And when, when we start talking about the legislation, there's things that affect the Carroll County Sheriff's Office and law enforcement in the county and throughout the state, and that we have to adjust to, whether it's policy or, or training. And then there's things that affect the overall uh, operation of the county, and it's uh, some fiscal issues that, that, that you guys um, are going to have to tackle and take on. So uh, going to, to the legislation. So as Mike said, there's, there's a number of pieces of legislation that have been floated <clears throat> by uh, a number of delegates and senators throughout the state. Uh, primarily in the in the Baltimore Washington area, you'll see the majority of the the reform uh, legislation that comes coming through. We believe that everything reform wise, when it comes to uh, law enforcement, will be captured under House Bill 670, and it's currently th moving through legislature, and it deals with a number of of issues um, when it comes to police reform. So uh, it LEOBR, which you guys have heard a lot on, Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. There's some training issues, uh, body-worn cameras, use of force, uh, MPIA uh, issues. So when it comes to the body-worn cameras, there's got to be some some uh, MPIA cleanup so that so that uh, certain things that we give out uh, can't be just handed out um, willy-nilly. We've got to be able to to follow the law when it comes to MPIA and giving those that information out. So you know, to to be able to give go through body-worn camera information and give it out in a timely manner, there's going to have to be some adjustments that are made um, to, to the MPIA uh, positioning. So um, we're not opposing it when it comes to body-worn cameras. Um, the sheriffs is, uh, and the chiefs have have asked for amendments in HB 670 with LEOBR, with um, uh, body-worn cameras, with a number of things that uh, that, that, that legislation entails. But we're not opposing sensible police reform by any means. Um, Mike did bring up LEOBR. Uh, this is my 32nd, 33rd year in law enforcement. My entire career, I've been under Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, never had an issue with it. The legislature thinks they're doing me a favor by amending LEOBR um, as the sheriff um, or, or uh, for Chief Ledwell, but they're not. We, we certainly can work under the current LEOBR system and weed out bad cops. I, I don't have an issue with that. Um, this current HB bill for body-worn cameras there doesn't appear to be any funding assistance to local governments for um, for this mandate. Uh, I, I believe that the reason is, is because the larger jurisdictions already have this and they've already funded it. So I don't think there's gonna be a whole lot of funding or or care for the, the rural jurisdictions that have to implement this. It's gonna be another unfunded mandate. Go ahead. Question, you said uh, other jurisdictions already have this. Do we know which ones? Yeah, there's a lot of jurisdictions that have it. So, you know, Baltimore City, Baltimore County are the larger jurisdictions that, that put it together. Um, Prince George's County has it, Montgomery County has it. I think the only uh, urban jurisdiction around here that doesn't have body-worn cameras right now would be Howard County or one of the, you know, the larger police departments. A lot of the smaller agencies throughout the state have it. Um, but the larger organizations that surround the Baltimore, Washington area predominantly have body-worn camera systems. So, the yes. have a uh, in-car camera system, but they don't have the body-worn. So with that said, do you know if, um, like you said, Howard, but Howard, Harford, Frederick, Cecil, Charles? Correct. Do they have it or you're not? Um, I don't. I've got Mark the board sitting here with me in research. Okay. And I'm not sure. Um, whether Harper or or uh, Charles have it or not. Yeah. Okay. Um, they would be the other larger jurisdictions. That look like ours predominantly. Okay, thanks. The, um, we believe that the mandate will be by 2025, and I think um, Mike briefed you on that a couple of meetings ago that we believe that'll be the phase-in period by uh, 2025. So, I, I you know, I, 
I don't say this reluctantly, if, if legislature mandated body worn cameras based on complaints driven by citizens, we'd be the last agency in the state to get it. Um, because we just simply don't uh, have a whole lot of issues um, when it comes to complaints outside of the organization. Uh, we, we, we often say that, that you've got to re recruit, hire, train, retain, and then continue to train throughout their career until they retire. And, and that keeps any complaints from happening. They're invested and we do a really good job with, with uh, training our personnel and, and keeping the complaints down. And, and so the body worn cameras were not against. And I think that what people, um, the, the, the proponents of it, the people that want law enforcement to have body worn cameras, I, I think they believe they're gonna see widespread misconduct and corruption. And um, I, I got news for you, you're gonna see the complete opposite, the absolute complete opposite. So uh, you'll see good policing and um, you'll see folks that care about their community. Uh, we have, um, in the next slide, piloted the program. So we knew that this was gonna be a part of legislature moving into this session. So uh, we reached out to uh, all of our partners here in Carroll County, uh, including Westminster PD. And we decided we would work with a company called WatchGuard, which um, does in-car camera and body cameras, and we would pilot the program. So you can see in the slide that in October, we started piloting the program. Um, my office, Sykesville PD, Manchester, Mount Airy, and Westminster PD began an evaluation, evaluation period of the body-worn cameras and technology. And just so you know that Hampstead PD, uh, they have the watch guard system with the in-car camera and the body-worn. Uh, Tawny Town PD has uh, in-car camera systems. And so there are a number of agencies throughout the county that have a variation of in-car or body-worn. So they opted out right now until uh, we, we got done our pilot period. So we did 10 body-worn cameras. My office piloted uh, four of them. So how does the data flow? So what happens when, when uh, a deputy gets out of a car or a police officer gets out of the car with an in-car camera system and a body-worn camera system? How does that information get into a system so that, so that we can review it? So the picture that you see in the, the lower half of it, you see a combination of the in-car camera and the body-worn camera. And you can see on the picture that uh, uh, the deputy was was wearing that in-car camera sits on, or the body camera sits on their chest. Um, and that was Nick Sherman, Deputy Nick Sherman. He's a big guy and he can't carry much more on his on his body other than that body camera. And I jokingly say, if I threw him in a pool, he'd sink right to the bottom and drown because he, he's got to weigh another 30, 40 pounds with everything that he's got on. So that body camera sits on the center of their chest. The in-car camera that you see to the right there's three cameras, one that shines out the front, that, that views out the front, one that goes out the back, and there's another one inside the car that you can adjust and you can watch a prisoner after you've taken them into custody. So that data is stored um, uh, in the cloud, and I'll go over that how that data works in the next slide. But essentially, it goes up into an evidence library. And so all the information goes up into an evidence library, and then there are different flows on how it gets to um, uh, other other parts of the of the agency. So inevitably, there's um, uh, MP, MPIA or FOIA requests that come in, uh, subpoena requests that come in, and that information has got to be passed along to our records unit um, so that they can go through a redaction and a fulfillment of it. And then eventually, it goes to a quality control check with supervision, and then we fulfill it. Now, let me give you one example. So a deputy with a body-worn camera that goes into a, a department store anywhere in the county for a theft. So um, in a lot of cases, we go into a department store after they've caught a shoplifter or loss prevention has. As they're navigating through the department store, before they get out of the car, they tap the camera, it turns on. As they're navigating through the department store and they go into loss prevention and they start interviewing, talking to the person that they have in custody, all that information is now being stored on the camera and it'll eventually be uploaded into this data flow that you see. But when it comes to over to the MPIA requests and then it goes to records unit for fulfillment and redaction, if Eric Boucher and Richard Weaver are at the department store walking through and we see you on that camera, we have to redact you. We have to redact voices. We have to redact 
uh, faces. And you see that when you look at some body worn camera where the faces are blurred out of people. And anybody that has nothing to do with that individual arrest or incident, we've got to redact that footage. The only way to redact it is to go through and watch it all. And so there's um, a lot that goes through um, redaction and then the quality control and quality assurance check before it's, it's uh, fulfilled. Now, with the four body cameras that we have and the requests that we've gotten and the redaction that we've had to make, we estimate somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four hours to fulfill one individual request for a body one camera footage. And that's from the time the, the MPIA comes in to it's actually fulfilled and goes through its quality control check. On the other side, you see um, it goes it goes into internal review. There's three three different ways kind of we look at other uh, the other information that's in the data flow or it's in the evidence library. So um, there will be quality control check within within the system so that we can do internal review uh, randomly of of traffic stops of incidents that take place. So essentially, what will happen is a commander or a supervisor will periodically go on to a camera that one of the deputies has and uh, do some quality control checks. So make sure their uh, officer survival skills are correct, um, training issues, how we're speaking with and dealing with citizens. Um, so internal review. And if we get any internal complaints that are driven by, by a call for service or a traffic stop, then we can go into the evidence library and start reviewing data that way. Then um, as the state's attorney comes on in a little bit, he'll explain to you the state's attorney uh, requests for discovery and the state's attorney's office um, uh, ability to redact and review the information. And just so you understand that um, when it comes to preparing uh, documents for court, yes, we send everything to the state's attorney's office, but when it comes to discovery and information that's got to go to defense attorneys on arrests that we make, it all has to come through the state's attorney's office. We do not supply recovery or discovery information for uh, defense attorneys. And the state's attorney will go through that in a little bit on how uh, his office has to comply with some of this stuff. So then you look at the hardware and, and the- yeah. Yeah. Quick question yes, for sir. you. Before you send the, the, uh, the video, I guess, to the state's attorneys or a defense attorney, do you go through and, and take out people's faces and all that aren't part of the crime before it gets sent to them as well? No, so that's their job. When so when we fulfill an MPI re, MPIA request that comes out of our office and would go to a, a citizen or to an insurance company or something like that that has nothing to do with the state's attorney, then we then we would redact that information. But only the state's attorney. The state's attorney takes the raw footage, and it's his office's responsibility to redact uh, the information because there may be something in there uh, that he decides he wants follow up on or information for witnesses, those sort of things. But the raw data all goes to the state's attorney for redaction. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. And Jim, another Hello. question. Jim, another question. Is there time, are there parameters assigned to the amount of time that you have uh, to, to complete an MPI a request or how does that work? Yes, sir. So we get, when we get an MPI re a request, to take, we have 10 days to fulfill it. Now we can, we can um, send a letter to the requester saying it's going to take us a little bit longer to fulfill this and um, get up to, I believe, 30 days uh, to fulfill the request. So the time, the timeline starts and it's pretty aggressive um, when it comes to, to getting these requests. So um, 10 days generally and up to 30 days if we communicate with and, and explain the need for the time to the requester. And I think, uh, Commissioner, I think you, everybody, that even when you guys get an MPIA request in your office, um, it applies to you guys as well. Um, because I get stuff from Tim Burke periodically that needs to fulfill a request that comes to the, to the larger body over at the commissioner's office. Anything else on that? So again, what you're seeing is on this screen, you're seeing the equipment. And so we believe that the total package for uh, body cams would include an in-car camera system. And we believe that's optimal. That's absolutely the best package that you can buy, which you see on, on the TV. And so essentially what happens, let's say you don't have an, a body camera and you have just an in-car camera. So the in-car camera system, what you see, take the body camera out of there, 
is in our patrol vehicle. Anytime a deputy, a trooper, an officer turns on their lights, it's situated, it's set up so that the camera automatically comes on. And so what happens is, is that a deputy officer or trooper has a, uh, a microphone. Usually it's right on their, on their uh, shirt, just under their, their chin so that when they speak, it can, be, it can be picked up and heard. And so when you see in-car camera footage, you're seeing the video from the camera, but you're hearing audio from the communication between the driver and the, and the law enforcement officer. And when the law enforcement officer goes up, they have to say, and I said this for many years, hi, I'm Trooper DeWeese with the Maryland State Police. This stop is being audio and visually recorded. It is something that we said constantly all the time. And my deputies now that are wearing body-worn cameras have to give a similar approach when they, when they make contact with someone, when feasible, when feasible. So it's something that I said just perhaps forever. So in this case, what you would see is you would see a body-worn camera, and you would also see in-car camera footage. The two would synchronize with one another. And so you would see the, the traffic stop itself. You'd see video coming out of the back of the car, in front of the car, but then you would also see the contact with the driver themselves. And so the synchronization would take place within the body-worn camera and the watch guard car system. If another deputy pulled up to uh, back up a, a deputy or multiple cars showed up on a scene, uh, this package automatically synchronized with each camera as an in-car camera system. So we started working with WatchGuard as we were looking through piloting the program. Um, they're already on a contract that we could piggyback off of if we chose to go in this direction. So we started looking at some preliminary prices and refining as much as we could and looking at the total package of this WatchGuard system, in-car camera, and body-worn camera system. And so you're looking at the total price for five years, 1.54 million. That includes an integrated camera system, unlimited video storage, which is huge over a five year period. That video storage does not go on the county's hardware system. It does not go on their server. It's cloud-based and it's all managed by, by WatchGuard. So uh, the video management software, of course the cloud-based system, the no fault warranty, um, a hardware refresh. So if there is a, a uh, a refresh that needs to be done every three years to give us better technology, then, then they will do that. Um, all the accessories are included, um, set up and configuration of the system, uh, camera installation, and then there are multiple payment options. So if, if, if you chose to, to take this one now, um, and you said, uh, we wanna pay for it all upfront for the five years and we can cover the 1.54 million, we believe that there are um, there are reductions in that. There 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 could be reductions into 1.54 million. You can finance it. You can do it annually through the budget. You can do it a, a number of different ways. But WatchGuard has explained to us that the 1.54 million dollars includes in-car camera, body-worn system, and that would be for 140 combination units. So we're looking at about 110 cars, and an additional 30 body warns for investigators, court security. Um, folks like that throughout the organization that would need body warrants that don't generally get in and out of the police cars. And so um, we, we believe that there would be a reduction in cost if the county chose to take it on all at once. And we can certainly um, refine those costs. Any questions on the costs? Hey, Jim, what about SROs? So that's a good question. So. Um, and, and I'm sitting here looking at an, at an article that I downloaded um, about body-worn cameras within, within the schools. There's no um, clear direction when it comes to, or there's no clear, I guess, uh, uh, you, you can't mandate that, that we don't wear it in the school. So the SROs would have them and they would operate under the same guidelines as a regular deputy. So they would only tap the camera and turn it on if there's an incident that they're responding to within, within the facility. And I would suggest that, the, that they would rarely turn it on in the school setting, only if they were running to an incident. Um, if they're going into a bathroom, the same thing applies. Um, if they're speaking with a student, um, counseling them on something or working with them on an issue, the camera would not come on. And you would know if the camera is on, if you look at this slide, there's a green button on top of it and it shows that it's on. So everybody would know that that camera is on. Um, so 
would we outfit them? We would likely do that. We would likely outfit our SROs with a camera. Um, you know, I'm looking at all this hardware that an officer has to wear now. I mean, this is getting quite a bit of um, around the waist, around the chest. He's really getting inundated with materials. But is this the only system uh, out there, the only way we can, the only one we can look at, or are there other systems? So I, I knew you guys were going to ask that. So inevitably, I, I'm looking at how how can I, what do I believe is optimal for the organization? Um, I believe that the in-car camera system and the body-worn camera system through, through WatchGuard is the absolute best product that's out on the market. And you guys, um, and I think you know this, and I've told you this before, you have a habit of buying really good stuff, um, whether you know it or not. You buy me the best cars for my deputies, the best bulletproof vests, the best handguns, and um, so the best equipment that we can put on these folks and send them out. Do I believe there's a better way that we, a way that we can do it? Yeah, I think that we can scale down and go with just body-worn cameras. And so if we went with just body-worn cameras, you're looking at, even if I went with just body-worn, uh, put a body-worn camera on every one of my deputies that would require it, give them an extra battery, and then what we would need to do, we, we would set up kiosks throughout the county, um, maybe four or five of them. I'd use local P PDs that I could work with and set up a downloading docking station um, for the deputy. So essentially, the deputy would then have a body-worn camera, nothing in car. They would go home every night. Before they went home and came off shift, they would have to dock that camera at one of the several locations throughout the county. It would download the data and then it would then go cloud-based. So it would, it would be there. They go home. They can put it in a charging dock that they have at their house and almost like their portable radio, they come on duty, it's fully charged and they're ready to go. The reason I like that system is because my deputies are coming in from all different parts of the county in their cars. And so if they handle something, um, it's, it's often that they'll get a call before they even get into the county or they'll hear the radio and say, I'll go to that. So to put a kiosk where they have to go and physically grab a camera would be extraordinarily inconvenient and may not capture some of the things that we're looking for. So what would be the cost? We believe the cost would run about a half million dollars over five years. So you're looking at a significant difference in cost. There is some, mod, I think, modest upfront money, I think about sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 in order to get those kiosks set up around the county. And then, and then have the deputies upfitted with them. So it is a it is a significant difference in cost. All the same applies if you just go with the body worn, but you're looking at a difference of about a million dollars over over a five year period. Um, so yeah, Commissioner, you're right. It is a it it, it, it is another option. The, the other option that I think Chief Ledwell is going to go with is um, a handful of cameras that are at his station because he does uh, a roll call every day at his station and then sends his folks out to the patrol areas from the, a physical location. And then they can come in each night and download the data. The other thing that I don't think is a good idea is phasing in something like this. And the reason I don't think phasing it in is a good idea for us is because who then do you decide gets a camera? And then what happens if something happens to a deputy or, or the data needs to be captured? And, and I have to say, we didn't have a camera on that that particular deputy. Um, I, I think that's a disadvantage if we if we just put a handful in play now and phase this in. Hey, Sheriff. Um, yes, sir. You, you know, the, the way you do business now works. So changing to a, a Hill Street Blues approach where everybody comes in and then dispatches um, is not the model that you use. So, you know, instead of adapting two things, I'd rather adapt one thing, and that is bringing these cameras into the, into the system, um, but not changing your operations because it, it, like I said, I believe it works. And I think you believe it works. The um, contract, you said there's an existing contract already with WatchCard. Is there an existing contract with WatchCard that Carroll County has the primary or is it within the state or uh, is it within your organization? I mean, ha what, what existing contract are we talking about? So it's not, we, we don't, we don't use them. Uh, uh, 
within the sheriff's office. And I don't believe Carroll County does, but it's a contract that can be piggybacked on. Um, currently, Hampstead PD has a contract with WatchGuard because they have this particular system. But there's a number of uh, organizations throughout the state that allows us to piggyback on this system without going out to um, an RFP. I mean, we're not recreating the wheel here. This is being done by a lot of organizations and it's been refined by WatchGuard. And there are other vendors that are out there that supply services. Um, and believe it or not, we communicated with those other vendors to try and test their equipment to see if, um, if it was better equipment. And very few of them got back to us to even, to even test them. In fact, WatchGuard was the only one that got back with us to, to test it. And there are other, Commissioner Rothstein, there are other, I guess, devices other than the body cam that sits on your chest. I think Baltimore County uses a set of glasses. And so you put on the glasses and the, the uh, camera sits on either the left or right side. Um, there are uh, ones that, that sit on your lapel here that you can, that you can strap to your lapel. It appears as though this particular piece of, of hardware is the most durable, but captures the majority of what we're looking for. Um, and you're right. I, I bring in people from a lot. It, it, if I brought everybody to Westminster, it, it drove all the way down here in our police cars and then sent them back out to their jurisdictions. It just simply wouldn't work. I mean, they've got to come in and they go straight to their patrol areas inevitably. Okay. How, how durable are these units? I mean, we have deputies diving into uh, 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 Bonnie Run to save people or to save people. We have, uh, you know, they're going to get down and dirty somewhere along the line, arresting somebody. How, how do they hold up? So they're water and weather resistant. I don't believe if we dive 15 feet to the bottom of the Liberty Reservoir that they're going to survive. But we do have a no-fault. This, this does come with uh, a no-fault warranty. Um, so uh, that camera would be replaced. So if, if there is an issue with a the camera, then WatchGuard with, with the total package will come along and replace that camera um, and the hardware and get us back up and running. But we also, um, with that package, are looking at spares. So you can't buy something like this without having a handful of spares that we can send out. Um, and replace and then send the camera itself back for replacement. So, um, yeah, they can go out into the snow and they can go out into the rain, but they're not going to be able to go to the bottom of the reservoir. The other thing that um, is interesting about this system is if we, with the, with the, if we went, Commissioner Weaver, with just a uh, uh, camera system and we went with a uh, these kiosks throughout the state, we believe that within the next year, there's gonna be technology um, through uh, Wi-Fi through our car that will automatically upload, allow us to upload the video from our cameras. Um, I believe Motorola was purchased, I'm sorry, I believe WatchGuard, as you can see, has been per uh, purchased by Motorola and we use Motorola radios and we believe that the technology is, now. we believe it's there now, um, but we, we believe that it'll be refined within a year so that we don't have to physically go anywhere, dock these things. We believe that the technology or the data will automatically be extracted through the in-car camera system or through the in-car systems that we have um, currently. Anything else on the equipment? So the equipment is the cheap part. Um, yeah, so positions. Um, and I've talked to all of you about this. So. My budget in 21 um, is going to look different than the recommended budget going into 22. And one of the significant things you're going to see is that there's there were four and a half positions that are still currently in the 21 budget um, from food services that were that were saved. And um, as we move into 20 the 22 budget, you're going to see that they've been that they've been removed. And I understand that. But as we currently sit in the 21 budget, um, I have four and a half positions through food services that were saved. Um, so, you know, uh, this is not, this, this is the, the difficult part of this is um, the positions required in order to administer a program this large. Let me throw this at you. So as you look at it, there's gotta be quality control. 
there's got to be records checks. I've got to have IT support. Um, and, and we believe we're going to need a total of nine positions. And if you guys were to fund the total of nine positions tomorrow for what I need, it'd be about $1.1 million a year in year one. And then it would go down a little bit after that, um, after equipment was purchased. If I can reallocate and repurpose the existing positions that I have in FY21, then we're looking at an approximate cost of $50,000 for one-time costs for year one. So, so how do I do that? So inevitably the Lieutenant Sergeant and Corporal, these, some of these folks are gonna be repurposed, but they're gonna have to take on more responsibility. I'm gonna have to stand up a, a digital evidence unit. And so I'm gonna bring on 140 cameras. And then I'm also, uh, I've got another 130 static cameras throughout the jail and, and uh, in different areas of the organization that, that we manage. Um, let me throw this out at you. In 2020, we made 21,267 traffic stops. We made 1,546 arrests. We arrested 163 people for DUI. We went to and responded to 550 traffic stops, and we had just under 60,000 calls for service. When you start putting body cameras on people, 21,267 traffic stops, there's a chance that somebody's gonna request data from one or more, if not all of those stops. 1,546 arrests included in that are 163, 163 DUI arrests that take a lot of time to process, that camera stays on the entire time. Traffic crashes, we go to a lot of them. We do a report for a lot of them. A lot of them don't result in charges or arrests, but insurance companies want the data that comes off of those cameras. Somebody's gotta sit and watch it, and somebody's gotta package it up for MPIA request, and somebody's gotta send it over to the state's attorney's office. We anticipate a significant increase an MPIA request and request it go over to the state's attorney. It's inevitable when you have that much camera footage, it's gonna go, it's gonna require an awful lot of personnel. And where did I grab these numbers at? Um, we looked at organizations that were about the size of the Carroll County Sheriff's Office and the amount of uh, uh, MPIA requests and discovery requests that they've got to fulfill and the amount of people that they use in their organizations in order to, to accomplish that task. I'll use Laurel PD and Wicomico County Sheriff's Office as examples. Now remember Laurel PD and Wicomico County Sheriff's Office don't have an additional 130 cameras in their jail. I do, they don't oversee corrections. Laurel PD uses 10 total people to administer their program, which is about the same amount of cameras that, that I would stand up Wicomico County Sheriff's Office uses 12 people to administer their program with about the same, they're slightly smaller than the Carroll County Sheriff's Office. They do not have a jail and they don't have the additional 130 cameras that I get requests for um, inevitably. So uh, that is what we believe it will cost and, and the amount of people that, we, that we're gonna need um, for, for the positions to administer this. And so as, as we move into the next phase of the budget, I want you to keep in mind that, that um, we can, if repurpose and reallocate, we can do this without um, adding additional pins. I've got the pins, I just need to be able to re repurpose them. The $50,000 one-time cost would be to um, upfit a digital, um, a digital surveillance unit a digital, a, a digital unit. So uh, with records techs, with people that can, can take all this. So we currently get these requests from the jail and other areas where there's a uh, ring footage that we've captured and, and the state attorney is gonna talk about that footage that he gets and other surveillance footage that is captured throughout the county involving cases. A, uh, a, a, a digital unit would, would get all those MPIA requests. And then we also have bus patrol that uh, that we would like to, to carry under this, but um, we believe we have the structure internally if we can use the current positions. That $50,000 would cover some licenses, equipment, and stand up a, a, a unit so that, that um, but that's one-time cost. 
and then the annual cost would continue from there. Um, that would look like the 21, 21 budget would already have in. And I know there's questions about personnel. Well, I definitely believe there's going to be questions about personnel. Going back to the requirement itself, um, if legislation, you know, passes and and there there is the requirement that's going to be levied on us, that's going to take place no later than 2025, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, and I know you shared that you do not believe piecemealing or phasing in the approach is the best approach. However, phasing in the approach may be the um, more economical, efficient approach for us to be able to uh, to handle. You'll be able to um, to handle that, I'm sure. Uh, have you gone through different courses of action on looking at how that phased approach would be or look be looked at? So, yeah, I mean, if, if you guys came along and say this is this is the direction we wanted to go and you wanted to phase it in, um, I will adjust. But but I will I will say this with respect, Commissioner, firmly. If if the commissioners do not allow for personnel to administer this program, you can give me all the cameras you want. I won't put them on my deputies. Right. And I don't care what legislature says. There's simply no way that I can put cameras on deputies and administer a program without support for the program. And I think the state's attorney is gonna say the same thing. Um, there are agencies that may have four or five people that can do it internally without any issue, but we're talking about standing up 140 cameras. So it's an awful lot of data that is gonna be, that is gonna be put out there. So if I had to, yes. The other thing I wanna caution you about is that um, you know, WatchGuard and Axon and everybody else is in the business of making money. The longer you go to put in this put it put in this program, the higher the price is going to be. And if we wait until the end of the the 2025 20, year, then hold on because they know they've got us. <laughs> Sheriff, I have to agree 100% with that comment because I think we're looking at a lot of inflationary indicators out there that all cause us to jump up. And a reflection of the surplus we potentially are looking at, I think it'd be good to get on top of this on the front end and get the personnel in place and try to figure out what the, the annual cost is going to be of personnel in your budget in the out years. I'm also really concerned that with new technology, that if we don't have the personnel and technology properly in place, this can cost us cases. And I'm sure the Leonardo has all mentioned this, that with a proper chain of command and ownership of evidence, we can lose cases if we do not have this properly set up from the very beginning. So I'm, I'm very much in support of this. I, uh, I worry about cases. I also worry about the civil aspects that, that it puts the, uh, that my office and the county um, under if we don't uh, properly administer it. I think if you go back to the fall of uh, uh, 20, you'll see an article out of the Frederick News Post that the state's attorney over out in, in uh, Charlie Smith is quoted in that article. What, what happened there was the Frederick Police Department decided they were just gonna buy a bunch of cameras and uh, put them into play. They had already had a handful. Um, state attorney over there had to deal with the data that was coming in. But ultimately what he said was, is you could put as many cameras as you want out there. Um, if I don't have the personnel to review the data, and properly handle that data, those cameras mean nothing to me. And so you can put, if we're, and I think the state's attorney, Mr. DeLeonardo is gonna say, I don't care if you buy one camera, if it's used 24 hours a day, it's the amount of cameras that are gonna be used um, and the amount of time that they're gonna capture data. So we could buy 10 cameras and say, well, if you only have 10 deputies out there then put 10 cameras on them and that's the cost. But those 10 cameras are gonna be used 24 seven, and that's the amount of data that it's gonna, that it's gonna put together. So, I, you know, the, the, the hardware itself, um, I don't think is the big ask. Ultimately, it's the personnel, and then the storage of that information is huge. And if you go back to the slide that talks about um, the price for, for the total package, um, I think the state attorney was over a couple of weeks ago saying he's gonna cripple the accounting server if if we don't look at avenues to go outside and store 
all this data and the amount of footage, if, if we were just to say, let's go on the server for the county, it wouldn't work. It, we would just cripple the county's storage. So this price included all the storage. And that's one of the bigger things that we looked at was how to deal with that storage. And as we start to, to work through storage, we're looking at taking more off of the county server and putting it on to our own storage system so that we can free up space. Sheriff, has your department interface and communicate with our director, Mr. Ripper, about the compatibility and, and us being in line with y'all? Has he weighed in on ideas or have you communicated with him? Yeah, we talked to Sixton a lot. Um, that, that's who our, our liaison is through IT and Sharp is attacked, knows exactly what we're doing. We communicate with him, I think, daily in some way, shape, or form. So, yes, they, they understand this. They understand uh, how this would work. Um, with the county system. And, and honestly, um, if, if this is the direction that you chose to go, IT really wouldn't see a whole lot of issue on their end because everything would be cloud-based through um, WatchGuard. We wouldn't really use the support of the county per se. Uh, the support from the county would come in um, at a location where we needed the internet technology um, and the Wi-Fi and those sort of things. But once this goes into the cloud, it's out of the county's hands. It's it's our data that gets shared um, based on the request that we get internally. Thank you. So um, in order to house all these people, and, and I wanna go back to some of the mandates and and the legislation that's out there. So there's a mandate in training. Um, there's a mandate with uh, use of force policies, which myself, Chief Ledwell, and the other chiefs throughout the county have worked on. I preach constantly training. We train as good as any organization in the country. And that's why our complaints are, are significantly down. We are in the process of looking at a virtual uh, a use of force um, system that would need to be housed so that um, deputies, both corrections and law enforcement um, could come in as well as allied agencies and work through use of force scenarios in as realistic a way as we can possibly make it, um, but I need space to do it. And there's gonna be mandates for that sort of training. Um, we currently use North Carroll High School. I know that you guys went in, went through a uh, purchase of that. Uh, we were included in that, which we're very appreciative of, but there is existing space up there that we, can, that we believe we can use for um, you know, a body-worn camera or a digit digital evidence unit um, in order to house those folks. The other thing is that Mr. DeLeonardo is going to need personnel that deal with just digital evidence. And we believe we can share that space together. Um, the state attorney and I also believe that having um, the digital evidence units from his shop and my shop together with a transition to, to body-worn camera um, would make it really seamless because it's going to be, um, we're novice at it and we're going to we're gonna to have to work with one another on, on these requests that come back and forth from his office to my office. So we're looking at um, uh, potentially getting approval to redesign existing space at North Carroll. Um, if you've been up there recently, we have had to expand space. And so we kind of took over a, a larger classroom that's a, a couple hallways down. It's next to Quartermaster so that we can spread out our current academy class, which we have there now. So we have 19 students that are in the academy now from all over the state, including my office. I'm currently running a, a correctional academy that we have there, and we also run in-service programs daily um, at North Carroll High School. So the space is very much, very much needed. I have no space here. Um, I'm in a building that's almost 200 years old. Um, my jail's 50-some years old, and I'm in a roadway building across the street that's old as Commissioner Bruchet. So, um, it, I mean, listen, the space I got, you guys know, and space is always an issue in the county. Um, I've got no other place to, to put people. Um, the other thing I want you to understand is that the space can be primitive. Um, and I've spoken with the folks that are purchasing uh, North Carroll. They're willing to work with us um, on a lease agreement for the existing space that's there and potentially working with standing up and maybe designing um, uh, that space for us to work with a digital evidence unit. 
But when you start putting, you know, I've looked at the community college, I've looked at the um, public safety training center. Uh, there's just simply no space for the amount of uh, programs that we're putting in and out of North Carroll High School. The community college, it, it, it isn't the best avenue for me, especially with a, a Milo machine or a machine that um, deals with use of force because there's inevitably a lot of screaming and yelling that goes with that because we're putting people in situations and we're asking them to work and them, work themselves out of it. And the Milo machine kind of, the way it works is if the deputy is successful within how they're communicating and verbally de-escalating, then we can take that scenario in a different direction. If they come in and they're out of control and they're not handling it the way we've trained them, then we can force a confrontation that should never have been forced. And there's real actors that, that um, play out different directions and the instructor can send the virtual scenario in that direction. We purchase weapons that are ours, um, that look like ours, that are retrofitted for the machine. So there's a lot of value in that, with, in that machine and the ability to train at North Carroll. We would eventually pull that classroom of deputies out once they've graduated and repurpose the larger space that they're in for a digital surveillance unit um, co-located by myself and the state's attorney's office. And then um, we would push the academy class back down to its original classroom space, which is the 5,000 square feet that you guys agreed on with the purchaser of North Carroll High School. So space is an issue and I've got to have space to put people. I just simply don't have it. And if you guys haven't, I, all of you have walked around my office, um, I'm out of it. I've got 20 people in the building that I'm in right now and it's 5,500 square feet. I can't close off walls any more than what I've got now. Sheriff, you have those old jail cells underneath you in the basement. Yeah, um, yeah that's a, the ghost tour comes through there. So I don't think they'd want to see any of my personnel sit through there and, they're, and it's pretty cold and, and damp down there. Um, it, I mean, it's, it, it, it is what it is. I'm, I'm telling you, I need space. And so I think that if, if, the, if the commissioners agree that we can look at the overall project and the space, I think that with the, the preliminary cost of leasing North Carroll High School and all of the space to deal with all of the programs, police academy, digital surveillance and, and training, purchase let's let's say let's say you guys decided 1.5 million we can do that over a five-year period i i believe that we can scale down to just body worn cameras and purchase and lease all the space at north carroll high school and and accomplish everything we need to accomplish for the same prices it would cost just to do in-car camera system and body warrants for a five-year period so I, I believe we can do all this for three hundred thousand dollars or thereabouts annually if i'm allowed to repurpose the pins that that came out of food service and um use the space at north carol i believe we can accomplish that and i think what needs to happen i know this is information you guys need to tell me what you're looking for um what questions you have what research you want me to do and i i i, I think that what needs to happen is during the budget process i need to refine all these numbers and then come back to you and say, here's, here's the, the, the refined numbers and what we believe is, is going to need, be needed in order to accomplish this program. And that's just for the sheriff's office. Sheriff, I appreciate the presentation. It was very well done. I'd like to, uh, if you could, have Sergeant Holland get in touch with me. I'd like to go back up to the North Carroll facility and look it over again to see what you exist and have and what you're talking about expanding into so I can get a good idea long-term what type of investment we'll need to make in the expansion of that facility for you. Yes, sir, that's easy to do. And I invite anybody, um, any of the commissioners, if you wanna set something up that we can walk through so that you can take a look at the, the space. One of the other things that we've done is we created a housing unit in one of the classrooms that we're looking at um, uh, ultimately uh, hoping to lease for the training unit. And that housing unit looks almost identical to a housing unit that you would see in the jail. And then we've, be, we've been able to take and put plexiglass doors on um, the housing unit to mock the going in and out of an individual cell so that we can train our deputies that are in, in service and keep up with the training requirements of uh, the mandates that are coming out of Annapolis and train them the best way to keep from injuring themselves and, and 
um, the inmates that we have housed. One of the things that Mike talked about was the legislation on housing and restrictive housing and segregating inmates. Um, and, and that's a huge issue. Uh, you know, we, we decide to uh, put inmates in housing units by themselves based, we don't just say, you know what, we don't like you, you're going into a housing unit by yourself. Um, it's based on a lot of factors that our classification folks and um, our command staff review every single morning. We're constantly moving people in and out of housing units based on a lot of factors. One of, one of them is, could be their medical needs. The other is how, how at risk are they from being injured if we put them in a housing unit with other, with other inmates. And that can be based on the crime they've committed or what we've learned about that individual. And um, I've said this to you guys before, we, we go to great lengths to keep the Hatfields and the McCoys out of the same housing units together. And so um, that's legislation that uh, Colonel Hardinger keeps a close eye on and that, uh, that we're participating in and making amendments to if needed. I'd like to state that your office has a tremendous amount of liability with it. And these cameras actually help protect you and us as a county long term. And I'm sure that a lot of your officers probably feel the same way because you get citizens make complaints that aren't founded. Having a camera system will negate that down for you and we'll have less liability exposure. So um, you're right. And, and my deputies would love to have them now. After the pilot program, um, we had three complaints that came in that were immediately um, unfounded based on the body camera footage that, that we had. I have internal investigators that will will go through great lengths to um, look at internal complaints that are made. But I will tell you, Commissioner, the overwhelming majority of the complaints that we investigate in this office and throughout law enforcement are internally driven. Very few come from citizen contact. Very, very few. And almost none in this county. I think last year, Colonel Hart would tell me that there may be, may be four or five um, that came from outside of the outside of the organization from citizens that had contact with one of my deputies that wanted to complain about something and the body camera stopped three of them in their tracks and if I didn't have body cameras then it could take upward of 80 100 or even more hours from an internal investigator to uh, to contact witnesses and put together an internal investigation to present to me for potential discipline so they have earned and awful lot of issues externally and i think initially we were standoffish i'll be honest with you body cameras were not something that was on my uh, radar uh legislature is now mandating it once we went through the pilot program then um the deputies are saying let's do it they like them um i i don't know that i would have back in the day but I, I don't know they only know what they know now so um, even if they don't have a body camera on, there's a camera somewhere taking a picture of what happens. It keeps everybody in check. It keeps it holds us accountable, and it also holds the people that we have contact with accountable. You made a really good point that there's actually a savings in this with the reduction of the investigations when you have the cameras. And also, I like to state that the lack of citizens' complaint is a, a very clear statement of the, the good job that your officers are doing in the field. Hey, Sheriff, I think you're muted. I think that means you move, move on to Dylan. Yeah, so, yeah. Thanks, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm silent for two seconds and you got rid of me. And, and didn't think I hear it. I'm just muted, not you. <laughs> hey, um, no, actually, Sheriff, I appreciate it. I appreciate the, uh, the, the, information the wealth of information you provided providing us situation awareness um especially as we're walking into as you know uh the budget sessions uh coming up very soon um understanding uh the impact um you know of the body cameras and you know your thoughts and ideas in moving this forward um a lot for us to uh think through uh you know today was obviously a day for uh, some discussion, but really for providing situation awareness to us um, on, on uh, 
the the body worn camera project. Um, now, with that, I see you got a summary slide up, and then we want to go to uh, either yeah, you Chief got or to Mr. So I, I think uh, the state's attorney would be up next, and then um, Chief okay. Ludwell can explain uh, his program, and then any overall questions that you have um, before we move on. Yep, I, I appreciate it. It's not this intent is not to cut you short of any. You're fine. You're I've, said what I needed. I've taken up an awful lot of time. I'm going to try and figure out unless Chris or someone in the control room can get rid of the screen and make and and then bring you guys back up. I'm going to try and figure out. I'm going to give Miss McDonald in here to. I, I to think we'll do. I think we'll take the uh, control from you and then take away the slide deck. So ah, there. You. Okay. okay. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank so, you. Our state's. Uh, Attorney, Mr. Brian DiLeonardo. Well, good morning, commissioners. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk. And I uh, I want to just make a couple preliminary points and then I'm going to do my best to share this PowerPoint presentation screen. So uh, first of all, as to the idea of it being mandated or not from the legislature, um, you know, this is something I've had discussion actually with uh, budget for uh, quite some time um, because it was clear to me that this was ultimately going to be something we were going to be required to do. But even apart from that, I think the question is whether it's something we should do. And I think certainly, uh, as the sheriff pointed out, my experience uh, with body cam footage has been incredibly helpful um, to not only having transparency uh, for any incidents that occur, but resolving them quickly. We in our office uh, have had the opportunity to handle uh, other shooting, uh, officer involved shooting cases from other jurisdictions where there were body cam footage. And I can tell you that, you know, that kind of information is really valuable um, in being able to, you know, deal with transparency, be able to reach the right result in any particular case. So I think apart from whatever legislation, I think there's an idea that the commissioners, as you would have to grasp, is, you know, what should we be doing? And and I think it's clear that um, there's a real value to the cameras being used. And uh, I agree with the sheriff. My experience is 99% of the time, um, it shows accurately that, you know, the officer was doing absolutely the right thing. And what I also think you find is that it de-escalates certain situations um, when people know it's being recorded. That's just my experience in finding this. Second of all, I would say um, this has also been a common question about is there going to be money tied with this? Um, and I, I deal a lot both as president of the Maryland State Attorney Association as well as our legislative uh, activities. And I think a resounding is uh, – Probably absolutely not. There's going to, because exactly what the sheriff was pointing out, the uh, larger jurisdictions that probably control, I believe, most of the voting power on issues like this in Annapolis, they're already funding. So I, I don't really anticipate that for all the outlying jurisdictions, that there's going to be a, a big demand to fund and to give money for us to implement it that when they didn't have that money from the outside to implement it. That's just what I hear and what my uh, sense is. The second point, and then I'm going to dive into to mine, which is um, there is a, a discussion today about body cams, um, but it, it is in the context of a larger issue, which is digital evidence. And obviously, I came before you not long ago um, to try to address a storage issue. And so as I step through here, I certainly want to talk about the body cams and the impacts of that. But there is obviously... Uh, a greater demand with all types of digital evidence that we're seeing. So uh, with that, I'm going to make my attempt to share here. You're good. You get that? Okay, I'm almost there. Two beautiful little girls. Sorry about that. I don't want ever be sorry for showing kids all right one second okay now i gotta get back there <laughs> now i gotta get back there what are you doing? 
Did we move on to Chief Ledwell now, Dennis? Or... <laughs> you got it? I wanted to give him a minute before I said that. <laughs> hey, Brian, we're not seeing it right now. We're seeing you, and that's that's it. Okay. Instead of two beautiful little girls, we see Commissioner Weaver and Commissioner Boucher. Oh, well, that's, uh, you can never know something that. Well, we are working on it here. Well, the sheriff had us on a body camera earlier at the department store. I think we we're in the sporting goods section, weren't we? Okay, uh, Brian, your the slide deck's back up. Okay. There you go. Yep, we got you. Okay, excellent. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, digital evidence and sort of the uh, amount of data that comes in and, and our obligations and why, um, you know, this becomes a real issue. So when we talk about digital evidence, um, certainly dash cameras, which are, you know, you've heard discussed today and which are already uh, been implemented, many have been implemented over, you know, over the last year. Uh, certainly body-worn cameras. We have uh, one department that is, you know, in, in implemented it more fully. We have pilot programs being done at uh, pretty much the sheriff's office and all of the municipal agencies. Uh, we also get uh, the closed circuit city videos, uh, whether those are static cameras set up with towns or in the city. Uh, we get enormous amount of ring or home security video uh, related to incidents that occur. Uh, we have video that is done with all of our recorded interviews and statements uh, that are tape recorded uh, or video recorded, um, typically. Uh, so we can wind up having hours of those in one incident. You certainly have implemented the school bus uh, video program. So those are things that, depending on the incident, would come through us. Uh, we get a lot of cell phone video. Every today, everybody is... Uh, shooting video the moment incidents are occurring. And when that happens, that is all evidence that in a criminal case, we have to collect and we have to do something. Um, we get store checkout register videos uh, with shoplifting. So you go into Martin's and you don't uh, buy your groceries or scan them, then we have all that video that we have to establish or places like Walmart. We get recorded jail calls. Uh, we have many times uh, individuals that are incarcerated waiting trial have conversations about their cases um, and their involvement, and that becomes evidence that we use. Certainly 911 calls, uh, intoxicated video. We have now video that records someone that is arrested and that is uh, taking the breath test. Uh, it, in fact, well, then um, that's video that becomes very relevant when we go to prove that case and the condition of the person. Um, and then YouTube video. Uh, we have individuals that will record incidents and post them on YouTube. Um, and so we often find that we actually sometimes are having cases where we have to go and, and certainly pull that down. So. I say this because when I talk about digital evidence, I'm talking about an entire world of evidence which has exponentially grown uh, actually over the last year, even more so. So when I'm talking about the significance of, of what this is, you know, we did analysis. Um, last year before uh, COVID outbreak, I had actually had a position request to start a first supervisor for digital evidence. And I had that in there because, you know, I knew that this was a growing issue and we were going to have a uh, problem keeping up. When COVID hit in light of the uh, concerns with budget and the impact that was going to be and knowing that our court system was shutting down, um, I, uh, I pulled that request. Obviously, I'm putting that request back in for this year, but we had already been doing the analysis. So here's a bit of the numbers. So in district court, 90% of our cases we're finding involves some kind of digital evidence. I mean, that's just amazing the amount of increase that we found. In our uh, circuit court, we're finding 
of those cases are resulting in the need for some digital evidence management. And we found 75% of our juvenile cases are involving, again, some type of digital evidence. Now, that has been a growth that we have seen tremendously over, like I said, certainly the last two years, uh, but even more so, strangely enough, during the pandemic, um, we have seen an exponential growth. And probably a lot of the home security cameras is a, is a big area, as well as the steps taken, as you heard outlined by the sheriff, with our departments. So with that being said, uh, we have to get all of that evidence and we have to be able to process that. And I'm gonna talk about our obligation, but the number of people that we have in our office dedicated to do that, unfortunately, is, uh, is none, okay? So you can imagine that this has been a whole new area for us I mean, cumulatively, we will get about five or 6,000 cases a year, criminal cases coming through. Um, so certainly this is a major issue. I heard uh, commissioners, you were asking a little bit earlier about, you know, kind of who has what. So uh, Tawny Town, uh, we currently are dealing with 10 dash cameras that they have uh, implemented. When we look at the Maryland State Police, they ended up uh, implementing 19 dash cameras. Um, and so that certainly uh, has added a load to our processing of evidence. Westminster, there's three closed circuit uh, city-based cameras, uh, and they are uh, piloting, as you heard and you will hear, the four body-worn cameras, and uh, I'm certainly looking to expand that. Carroll County Public Schools, they have their, uh, we get school surveillance videos on, on assaults or incidents that happen there. Um, but now we also have the addition at times where there's school bus camera um, video that may be used for violations. With Mount Airy, uh, they have 10 dash cameras and they are piling one body worn camera at the moment. Um, we talk about Hampstead um, and with Hampstead, we have four dash cameras. They have nine permanent body worn cameras now. They kind of jumped all in, and, and so they actually have uh, their department outfitted with body worn cameras. Uh, I don't want to leave out or forget that we uh, also have, um, you know, when we talk about uh, Manchester, they have one uh, body worn camera that they're using. McDaniel College, uh, there's 13 closed circuit, and we sometimes will forget about the colleges, but that is a big issue too. Um, and so those surveillance cameras are issues that we address. When we um, talk about the sheriff's office, uh, there are the implementation of dash cameras in some of the vehicles. Uh, they have the ring doorbell program where they get you know, the video that is provided from citizens. Certainly with the detention center, there is um, video that we often will deal with from incidents in the jail, as well as jail calls. And you've heard currently the four body worn cameras that are being piloted. Um, when we talk about Sykesville, um, that is a situation where there's two city cameras that also, again, they're there for a reason where they could produce information that we need. They are piloting a body-worn camera and expect two more in this year. So um, I think clearly we're seeing the evolution of that. We also have the Baltimore Environmental uh, Group, that, that agency. Um, they are intending to implement body-worn cameras soon as well. So I just think it's important to first give an overview of the entire county. For us, obviously, all of these um, come in through our office. Um, and so we have to be able to handle the video in, in all these different formats. So, hey, Brian, before uh, just to yeah. pause real quick, are all of those body worn cameras uh, out of watch guard vendor? And this is not necessarily for you, but it's for a uh, sheriff or unless you can answer. I can't answer. The answer is yes. I mean, one of the, the big issues um, that uh, we all sat down and worked on. And from my standpoint, what I need is consistency. Um, I certainly would not want to have different agencies using different 
uh, platforms, um, it would make it obviously that much more difficult. So even earlier when I came to talk about our storage, I wanted to make sure it was consistent with the body worn cameras and the dash cameras that are out there. So yes, everybody has moved to WatchGuard. Um, I think the reality is it sort of is the gold standard in this area. It is used and it provides a compatibility among all the different agencies. Uh, and certainly for us, having it, you know, in one format is, uh, it prevents us from having to have different mechanisms to deal with the data. So yeah. Is, um, is Baltimore County, Baltimore City also using WatchGuard so we can share and transfer information? I, I, I'm not sure that is, that they use uh, WatchGuard. I, I, I'd have to check on that, um, okay. but, um, no, I think they're Axon. Okay, they're Axon. Um, but I think using what we do is probably the best. Okay. Last question. I, I apologize. Is sure. WatchGuard is using a Motorola platform. Are the other companies using also Motorola platforms, or are they using other uh, variants or other uh, brands? Yeah. Um, absolutely other varieties okay um, the key is i think what we're using and is certainly when i came in and i talked about vault and and our uh, editing we've made sure that that was um compatible right. so we were interested in a platform where even when we deal with for example baltimore county video that we would still be able to handle that and, and right. we, with our platform okay thanks okay. So uh, this is just an example of, you know, sometimes we forget when we talk about, like we put out a dash camera or, or, or body worn camera, you know, there is ultimately multiple angles of the same incident that each has to be reviewed. So here's an incident where you see both a dash cam, um, you would see a body worn camera, and you would also see an in-car camera which is another aspect of this. So when a defendant is placed in the, in the vehicle, um, there's also a camera on them in the back seat. So uh, that's an example where, you know, when we talk about this, I just want to make sure it's clear that, that if there's multiple formats going on at the same time that we have to address. Um, same with body-worn cameras. I mean, we will have, uh, a situation where if I have three officers in a case that are all out wearing body worn cameras, um, we're in a position where we have to look at each one of those incident, you know, all those perspectives uh, to review the video. So while it's now one incident that has occurred, there's going to be multiple body cams, there's multiple in car cameras and, um, and so that's something we have to be mindful of as we go forward. So I, I wanted to try to give an example of, um, uh, of just a simple case, because I think it's important to help stress or to understand when I talk about the significance on our office and the workload. So um, let's just take a, a normal call for uh, shoplifting at, let's say, one of our big box stores. Okay, so when we have an incident that, that occurs along those lines, um, for us, we could potentially have uh, two officers responding, and in that incident, we will have uh, dash cams, we will have on scene, both from, you know, that dash cam as well as transporting. We could potentially have had two suspects uh, with audio and video each reporting an hour on the site. So that ultimately amounts to about six hours of total footage for two officers with, you know, in-car cams and body cams responding to the scene. We probably would also have a surveillance camera angles from inside the store. So let's assume we get 15 angles. We will typically get outside the, the building, walking into the building, being tracked within the building, leaving the building at the register. Um, it's not uncommon for us to be about have 30 minutes um, from each of those angles, which is about another seven and a half hours of footage. So we're talking at that point about 13 and a half hours of total footage from two officers responding to a shoplift. 
okay, which obviously is a misdemeanor offense. We're not even talking about our most serious offense that may bring, you know, a dozen deputies uh, or officers out to a scene. So when we think about that issue, we're talking about about an hour and a half, uh, 1.5 hours for every hour of footage. Um, and that is to mark it, to tag it, to redact the things that we're required to do and to shield uh, what's required. So for us on the back end, it takes us over 20 hours to prepare footage for one shoplifting case. And, and I mean, that is accurate. I mean, that is absolutely accurate, the amount of footage that and the process that we have to go through on the back end when we do this. Now, it's important to also note that that's assuming that everything goes perfect, okay, which I think we all know isn't the way it happens. Um, we encounter all kinds of issues. Uh, we get inconsistent players or, or basically platforms. Um, we have many times where we have to search out something that's going to be able to play the video because we're getting it from a, a private citizen um, who's using some different kind of equipment. Uh, we get errors in it being sent in. Uh, sometimes they send it, it doesn't work, it didn't transfer properly. Uh, we have situations where the wrong video gets sent to us. So now I have someone that's tracking down the right video. Uh, some of the videos are labeled, uh, we get that are incorrect. Uh, sometimes we get the wrong officer name on the camera that has come up. Um, and so we have to take the effort to identify who actually the camera belongs to. Uh, we have issues saving or copying the videos sometimes, uh, or corrupt files. Um, so I, I put all of this on because, uh, you know, it's important to recognize that when I talk about the hours, I'm talking about it goes well. Um, and these are just some of the issues that my staff has, has a, had to address. Sometimes it can take hours to deal with one of these issues. Um, and ultimately, we also, I mean, this video is important for trial, to go into court and be able to present to a judge or to a jury so I've got to have people that can package this for presentation. And so those are all issues that we've uh, uh, dealt with. When we talk a little bit about what some of the other jurisdictions are doing, um, you know, obviously, you know, a place like Baltimore County is, is far larger. Um, they have 1,600 body-worn cameras in use. Uh, they have 14 full-time staff seven part-time staff and six interns that are only, and I repeat only, assigned to downloading, shielding, or redacting body, uh, body worn camera footage. Again, we have none. Frederick uh, is now in a position of, of 119 uh, body worn cameras. One attorney supervisor that's reviewing the felonies. They have one IT service and four investigators that are uh, designed to mark and shield. So they have uh, six um, for 120 cameras. So just to put that a bit in perspective, I do think it's important and I, I want to present this to you because we talk about discovery obligation. And I think it's important um, when you have to make funding decisions. And I've always said I, I, I wouldn't want your job, right? You know, it's a tough decision to figure out uh, what to fund and what to not to fund. Um, my uh, perspective is what my role is to tell you what we have to do to meet our constitutional obligations and to secure convictions. And, and I can tell you that um, this area has been, continued to become a very hot topic and, and grow. But in the end, as you see, we have the obligation, all evidence, including recording, that we intend to use a trial, we must provide. Um, any of the information um, any electronic surveillance we must provide, uh, any evidence that uh, or statements uh, of the defendant or witness we must provide. And what these are requiring is if we don't, then we lose that case. That case gets dismissed. Um, that's the thing that'll keep you up at night as prosecutors. You know, I never, ever uh, want to have a citizen that I have to explain that because we didn't meet our constitutional discovery obligations, we can't go forward. I, I just will not allow that. 
Um, so we work incredibly hard. We have incredibly uh, uh, competent staff to do this. Now, I, I say this as well, like we are required to meet this obligation, whether it's in our possession or not. So when uh, a department is using body worn cameras, we have to collect that information. Like it's not enough. We are not in a position where we can simply say not our problem. Like that obligation is on us regardless. Um, when we talk about redaction, so there are very important issues that come up for us. Um, I mean, for example, we will have situations where we may be dealing with confidential informants. So we have to be able to ensure that that is properly redacted and not just on the fly. Like we have information that that gets turned over. Um, we're not getting it back. You know, we have to make sure that it's done and it's done correctly. We will sometimes ask for uh, protective orders to, you know, to get the court to uh, pass an order that allows us not to comply because the information is sensitive. Um, and we will do that. We have to get rid of personal identifying information, um, people's license, social security numbers, uh, medical information. We have, uh, for example, officers that may uh, respond to a hospital you know, we need to be able to redact the information that's being done there. We have officers that will be responding in the middle of the night to a domestic, and there might be young children. There may be people partially clothed. Uh, again, we have to have people that understand the legal requirements we must meet and can do this. There's many times in the footage where there's a discussion about outstanding warrants for criminal record. We have to redact that. We are not allowed to provide that out into the, you know, into the sphere, both as to a defendant, as well as, um, you know, we have to recognize when we pass this information off, someone could go do something with it. They could post it on YouTube. You know, we have to be very careful when we are processing this data that we're doing it right. Um, certainly, uh, as the sheriff indicated, while they will get uh, public Information Act requests, certainly we will as well. Um, I think in many ways we may become the uh, big source of this for all criminal because we will be uh, a repository to that extent in terms of all the municipalities and all the departments. Um, so we're not going to be able to, to shrink from that obligation. Um, now, certainly when we have ongoing investigations, um, we can... Uh, answer that it's not something we have to comply with because it's a pending investigation or a pending prosecution. But certainly once those cases are resolved, we would have to do that. Still, those shielding and redaction obligations will exist. Um, and so, you know, we have to be prepared for that. So um, I talked a little bit about our obligations. Now I want to talk about who can do this job. I mean, the reality is for us, um, I've it's an evidentiary issue. I have to have uh, people that have legal background that can understand uh, the significance of what they're watching and that there are in fact uh, something relevant that needs to be dealt with. They will also be making notations for attorneys because I can't have uh, someone who's redacting watching 20 hours of footage and now the prosecutor has to watch 20 hours of footage to figure out what they're going to use out of it. So these are people that I need them to be able to mark, hey, at, at minute three, the defendant makes a statement. At minute you know, 415, they find the drugs. Like That way, when it goes to the prosecutor, we're not redoing uh, all of the watching. They're also going to have to be able to prepare these videos for trial. I mean, that is a major issue that we have where we have to be able to present this in court uh, because it is evidence and sometimes it is critical evidence. They need to have an expertise in handling all the media and the editing and the software. Um, so this is, you know, it's a challenging area to do. And it's a challenging area because they also have to work with all the different municipal agencies in order to accomplish this task. So, I mean, I think that is uh, a reason why when I talk about this, that I, I just wanted to impress informationally that that's the issue. Um, now, I'm coming forward, obviously, this budget session. I'm, I'm asking for 
um, a lawyer to be overseeing the unit as well as at least one, and that's just based on what we have right now, additional person uh, to handle the onslaught of digital evidence we have now. I certainly anticipate if, if there is a rollout more generally uh, to the community with body worn cameras and certainly knowing the ex, uh, expansion of digital evidence, I expect we would need probably a total of six positions. Um, and these would be paralegal level uh, positions. Uh, they're either going to be, for example, investigators uh, that have been doing this would be paralegals. That has been the format that we have seen elsewhere. And, and the reality is with the obligations and the importance and weight, the legal significance being placed on these redactions and, and what's being marked, uh, there's really no other option. So um, with that, I, I certainly can uh, you know, turn it back to you, but I just wanted to make sure at least this gave a little bit of perspective on what we're experiencing and, and a recognition that you know, we have to deal with that for every agency in the county. <laughs> Mr. Thank D. Leonardo, you. if I may, you laid out a really good presentation there. And this is what, a, is what I was concerned with when the sheriff spoke, how we meet all this technology with the discovery and the evidence procedures. Because I'm sure there's defense attorneys out there who've won cases on just little teeny glitches. And there's so many different options you laid out that things can go wrong. So I appreciate this presentation to clarify for the public what we're faced with, and in particular, the hurdle that you're faced with overcoming. But I think once we make the investment, this should run much smoother for your operation and for the sheriff. So it's a matter of trying to get the capital together and get the, this all in place for you. So I'm very supportive of this and I appreciate your presentation. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Rouche. And I, and I do think it's important. I mean, you know, the sheriff, uh, Chief Ledwell, uh, you know, we, have met to talk about this for a period and i think one of the benefits uh and i think it's important for the the, the, commit, you know, the citizens that may be listening um you know this is what makes it i think work so well and what the presentations work so well in the county is that we've continued this dialogue uh from and this has been going on for some time where this was talked about and uh and how we work together so that we don't run into a problem i think it's the sheriff mentioned like in frederick where you know, you had a department doing all these things, but the state's attorney's office didn't get the things in place it needed to really process this. Um, I think we're trying to bring it jointly so we don't run into those problems. Thank you. And also, it emphasizes that we shouldn't go cheap with this. I mean, I'm all about investing in quality, and on the long term, it will pay off for us. I don't want to do, do anything cheap on, and get you guys implemented. Okay. Um, yeah, Tom Lovell, and I don't know if you want to go to him now, uh, Commissioner Rothstein, or how yeah. you want to. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, first off, uh, yeah, Brian, thank you for the information again, giving us, providing us situation awareness on what, you know, challenges lie ahead for you and how you're thinking through the process as well. Um, again, the intent here is providing the briefing, uh, no decisions, but more. Uh, the discussion and getting us along with the community um, the situation awareness of uh, the body worn camera project as a whole for Carroll County. Chief uh, Ledwell. Good morning, Good commissioners. Morning. Thank you for having me on. Yep. So I think between the sheriff and the state's attorney, you guys have been given a lot of details. I think they've done an excellent job at hitting all the major points. I don't want to be redundant and uh, drag this on any longer. I'll offer a few things. Um, I think when we talk about who we decide to go with, if, if we're headed in this direction, um, you know, just like when we get our vehicles upfitted and equipped, if you don't have a vendor who is responsive and available to your needs, it can be a nightmare. So, you know, once we have a system like this up and running, the expectation is that we're gonna we're gonna have them on us when we're doing business. So if we had equipment that would go down and we can't get a hold of a vendor because, you know, they're either unavailable or not responsive, that could be a nightmare for us. So I think one of the things in our discussions and our planning was that this particular vendor 
um, through uh, some of the individuals that are involved in this work group had a, has a history of being very responsive to the smaller agencies. So that's a big factor for us. Um, video evidence, it's not an easy or inexpensive prospect as, as you've heard, but it is the reality of modern policing from a number of uh, standpoints. We solve a good amount of our open investigations through video cameras that are in particular areas that we locate. And without that video evidence, we would probably have ongoing open cases. Um, we also have unfounded significant allegations like robbery and rape because we've been able to locate uh, video cameras that have refuted what was reported to us. So this is an opportunity cost. It, it saves our investigators a lot of time and effort in um, going through the motions had we not had that ability to um, get that definitive evidence. I think when rightfully so, the sheriff talks about how few uh, externally generated complaints we have compared to other jurisdictions, he's absolutely correct. The issue now though is it only takes one emotional incident that could make our agency or the sheriff's office or any other agency the focus of national attention and i think the expectation is that we have this technology now in policing and if we didn't and we were unfortunate uh, to have that kind of incident to refute or to get out that video footage right away that that refutes what what even the perception that, that tends to circulate now on social media and to exponentially spread, you know, nationally, internationally, um, it would be, it would put us in a very difficult position. So I think this needs to be looked at when we're talking about liability mitigation. Um, the ability to get in front of something like that uh, is crucial. And if we don't have that ability, then we're stuck with trying to get people to believe our word, um, which I, I think locally, we'd have more success, but in the, um, you know, national spotlight, that's a difficult hurdle because you're, you know, it happened unless you can prove otherwise in, in, in social media, it seems like. So we've got all that to consider. Um, the evidence support, both criminal and traffic arrests, I touched on that a bit. Trust and transparency are big uh, topics in the police reform uh, movement. I think, you know, the body worn cameras, the in-car systems, they, 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 they support that trust and transparency from the community towards us as police officers and as deputies. Um, the ability to de-escalate, since we've had these four cameras uh, on trial and evaluation out in the field, we've had several incidents that just the mere presence, uh, the calming of, uh, of the situation was directly affected by us being able to say to the individual or, or the group that they're being video and audio recorded. So it has that um, effect also. Um, I've been surprised at anecdotally here through the chain, the overwhelming support of the program from our uh, line officers and our rank and file. Uh, you know, I think that that our officers and our supervisors know that, uh, you know, it's not a gotcha tool. It's a, um, you know, uh, a support of what's being done, what's being said um, uh, out on the street. And I think the officers want them uh, for that purpose. I think it does hold everybody accountable. And I think it, it, it might help to prevent things like civility complaints that, you know, you might think otherwise before you use particular language or, or something. Although we don't have, uh, you know, a, a significant problem with that, you know, it, it works both ways. And in the majority of, if not all of the cases, it's going to show that we did things right. So um, we've had our officers and our supervisors showing support for them and, and, and wanting to get them. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. Also, you know, it's not a one size fits all tool. So as you guys have astutely pointed out, there's a difference between the Westminster Police Department operations and the Carroll County Sheriff's Office operations. They cover a much larger geographic area. They have a different operating 
um, uh, process. Our plan is to have the kiosks here to share the cameras. We have an incoming shift and we have an outgoing shift um, uh, so that, that we can have that uh, cost savings. Um, I don't think that that would be feasible with the sheriff's office because they just don't operate the same way as us. So um, we also considered, you know, the, the timing of the whole budget process here is, is difficult because, you know, we don't know what the state's attorney's office will be able to stand up as he just talked about um, to handle the video footage that we would provide to him for discovery purposes. So we have decided to start incrementally. Um, but one of the good things about uh, WatchGuard is that there is not a huge cost increase to increasing the number of cameras. The hardware upfront costs would pay for the kiosks, for the upfitting. We, we, we're looking to upfit our um, prisoner transport vehicle in the back. Um, but the actual cameras, it is a uh, per month fee that would go into the, um, the annual contract. So the infrastructure, in essence, would be in place for the body-worn cameras. So if, if we were to look at going from going, starting with 10 versus five cameras, there wouldn't be a huge um, ask from a capital standpoint for us to do that. So we don't want to overwhelm the state's attorney's office with footage, especially as we're, you know, uh, in the putting our toe, dipping our toe in the water fiscal year, figuring out how much staffing this is going to require. Uh, so we, uh, that's one of the reasons why we decided to start incrementally. But we also can, I think, <laughs> at a relatively low cost, um, increase the number of cameras, body-worn cameras that we put into play uh, because it wouldn't be a big capital cost. It would just be an addition of uh, the annual fee that goes into the, the camera system. We also, unlike the sheriff's office, will be able to, since we can share the cameras and we have that ability, to probably outfit our uniform personnel with about 15 cameras. So it's, it's apples to oranges versus, you know, what the sheriff has to prepare for, especially between all of his patrol staff and, and um, correction staff. So that's kind of our take or my take on it in a nutshell. And if you have any questions for me specifically, I'd be happy to answer them. Chief Ludwell, I just want to appreciate the service that he's provided, validating the quality control of the vendor. That was my concern. You express that they have a good track record with other jurisdictions. So this is a no fly by night operation that we can depend very heavily on their service. In the future. Hey, Chief, uh, Mr. Ralston, uh, would it be okay, okay if I comment quickly? Yep, just, just real quick, let me just uh, share, Chief. Just appreciate the insight, uh, the candidness. You know, I always believe commander on the ground has the best information. So you and the sheriff providing that is uh is good for us for again situation awareness in uh in moving forward so go ahead uh brian thank you i, I just wanted to to touch on i think real quickly what we said first of all as chief ledwell noted it, it makes obviously a lot of sense for his department to use the rotation of the cameras as opposed to the sheriff's office which operationally is very different so but for us it matters the amount of footage that's being done, whether it's one camera that's being shared or one camera that's only on one deputy. So for us, it doesn't really matter um, how many cameras there are, it's how many are active in the 24 hour period is, is what we deal with. Second thing is, I know there was a discussion about like stepping partially or not. And, and obviously, I mean, how it's done affects our office and our staffing, but I do think it's important. I think Chief Ledwell kind of notes that, like, you know, who do we give them to? If we give four or five, like, you know, then if we're in a position of selecting which officers will have them and we, uh, God forbid, have an incident um, and, and we don't have that uh, accuracy and transparency of body cam footage, then, um, you know, we're missing an opportunity there. And I, and I do think that is irrelevant. I know several years ago, there was a, a shooting case that I had to review that occurred over by the hospital. And, um, you know, we were relying on individual cell phone 
footage as well as hospital surveillance footage. I can't imagine how you know, beneficial it would have been to actually have body cam footage of audio. So I, I do think it's something uh, to keep in mind. And last, uh, certainly not least, um, I, I would offer any of you, if you decide uh, that it's something you're interested in, I'd be happy to take you over, for example, to Baltimore County and take a look at their redaction and editing uh, section and kind of get a sense to see what really goes into it from our side. So I'll put that out there. Obviously, any of you could, could ask, and uh, I'd be happy to take you and arrange that. So thank you, thank you all. I, I just wanted to say thank you for painting the picture of the county here from the municipalities, sheriff's office, state's attorney's office, and our responsibilities as they're going to be dictated to us, I'm sure, here in the future. But you guys have done a great job of really laying it out financially and obligations we, we're going to be picking up for public safety. And uh, it's scary. It really is the amount of obligations this is going to uh, we're going to have to take on to do this, but thank all three of you for putting this together in that package. I, I'd like to thank you all as well. Uh, Sheriff, I have a question for you. Do you have dash cameras on your cars right now on sheriff vehicles? I only have a camera in the transport vans that we use. Oh, just so I don't have any, no dash cameras and we're piloting okay. for a body worn camera. So that's all we have. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Gentlemen, once again, thank you uh, for your time. Uh, an hour and a half, I believe, well spent on a lot of information that you shared. So with that, let's uh, move on to uh, Fire and EMS. I believe uh, Bob McCoy could be up, our Director of Fire and EMS. Give us a few minutes of what's been going on and pass forward. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, what I want to do is uh, just start off uh, with our presentation this morning. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. We got it. Okay. Let me start to... Trying to start my slideshow a little bit. So for the sake of time, I always start out each morning um, going over uh, what we originally started with, what the three primary questions were. So for the sake of time, I'll go over those again. Um, I'll just go through those slides. Um, what we decided back in November the 2020, the direction we were provided, uh, we had four milestone goals, which were the MOU, the budget, the hiring and the public safety training center. So today's objective, what we want to do is review the current budget commitment uh, of the Carroll County Fire Service. Currently, FY21, uh, there's a total commitment of approximately $13,800,000. That consists of station personnel, operations, the LOSAP program that we fund uh, for the volunteer system. And then the fire EMS department, that's the current set, uh, budget for the fire EMS, uh, which consists of Casey and myself, and then the, the small um, budgetary items that are required. When we look at budget categories, what I'd like to do is switch to another screen show you uh, what we currently fund. I went through the budgets uh, for the volunteer stations. And this is an all inclusive, but it lists the categories and the subcategories uh, of operational items that we fund through the volunteer budget. In talking with the presidents, um, one of the overlying concerns I hear, I believe, is will we continue to be funded throughout the future? So if you look at all these items, we go to training, protective equipment, all the way down to fuels, disposable supplies, utilities, insurance, um, dues, memberships, contractual services for equipment and buildings and apparatus, 
interest expense, public education, and we even fund some major projects to keep these firehouses uh, operational. So I believe one of the major concerns is that we continue to fund these items uh, it, as the, we transition to the fire EMS department. So my recommendation uh, is that we continue to fund all the operational components of the fire EMS department. And I think the benefits, absolutely, we continue to provide an outstanding service. I, when I go through each of the stations, I go through the budget. Uh, the commissioners have been uh, graciously funding the fire service for years. We have some of the best equipment uh, out there on the apparatus uh, and in the stations. So we'd like to want to be able to continue that. Uh, continues to maintain all the stations and apparatus uh, while we prepare for the future. But I think what the key is in, in, in ensuring that we continue to support the operational aspects is it assures the volunteer stations that funding will continue even as the department expands. As far as risks, there are none. Um, to me, we, we've assumed responsibility for the fire and EMS department. Um, it is advantageous and in our best interest to continue funding all aspects. Each budget year, we will identify efficiencies uh, as we go through the budget. Um, over time, you will see, a, even though we will fund the same uh, categories uh, through the budget process, you may see a change in who actually pays the bill. There will be times where money, instead of going to CC Visa to uh, actually pay for items or be funneled to the stations for individual payment, uh, you'll see the county handling that uh, within house. And the benefits is the cost savings for the county through existing procurement and bulk purchasing. It removes additional burdens of the volunteers trying to secure savings while utilizing the purchasing power of the county. And it coincides with a one department approach. Uh, as we come together, we all need to work together uh, to make this as cost effective and outstanding department as possible. And risks associated with the budget transition I see is none as well. So for 2000 FY22, I should say, for the FY22 budget process, we've identified certain areas that we believe the funding could remain with the county. Uh, we would be able to ensure some efficiencies and some savings. And the items that we at least identified this year, we haven't finalized, are uh, PPE, utilities for the fire stations, fuel for each station, each station has their own tanks, trash removal, pest control, elevator service maintenance inspection, fire alarms, same thing, service maintenance inspections, the public safety training center, the manager's position, uh, which we currently fund through CC Visa, the public safety training center EMS coordinator, the ATR, the hazmat, public information, TFMC, which is the uh, training center committee, the EMS 24 seven and EVOD money, which would transfer back to the county as we assign personnel. These are all areas that we believe could stay with the county in FY 22, uh, possibly uh, uh, enjoy some efficiencies uh, with those line items. And then each year as we progress in the department development, you'll slowly see more opportunities uh, for savings uh, as we look into more of the subcategories and maybe the development of a quartermaster bulk purchasing program. So that's what I have today as far as budget. Like I said, I, I wanted to remain brief. Uh, next update, uh, we'll present hiring options, which is actually Thursday. Uh, and we'll discuss the application requests for the SAFER grant, uh, which is Thursday the 25th. So if you have any questions, I'm more than welcome to answer any. The uh, application for the SAFER grant has not been forwarded yet? That's correct. We are drafting it uh, for your decision. It's not due until March 12th. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Any uh, comments, questions, discussion for Bob at this time? Thank you for the brief update. 
Okay. <laughs> Bree, you ahead. like it? You like Bree? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have uh, some questions later on as we get more, as we delve more into the um, specific areas, Bob, of what you're, you're, you're uh, presenting here when it comes to the budget. One of the areas that I'm specifically focused on is I'm really having some issues uh, with, and he didn't bring it up today. I know that's going to be later on down the road, but purchasing all these uh, transport units, I, I got a real, I got a real issue with that. And I think there's a place that's a, that's an example of a place where we need to maybe save a little money and, and do something else there. Um, you know, we just heard a, a, a really long presentation, but a good presentation on, on the body uh, camera and, and the personnel associated with getting that in place. And that goes in hand with what we're suggesting here. And I've talked about it before, the internal positions that we're gonna need uh, as we begin to progress into this, this department. So I, I just wanna put that on the radar. I think there are gonna be areas that we're gonna really have to talk about. And that's the one area that I'm having a real problem with is, um, is purchasing all those things out of the gate. I just, uh, I'm hopeful that we can talk about things like that and maybe come up with a, a different way to do it. Uh, so appreciate appreciate that today and I look forward to uh, to Thursday. Sounds good. Thank you, commissioners. Yeah, I think uh, devil's in the details in a lot of this. You're starting very broad, very big macro uh, chunks, but um, getting into the specifics, you know, is where we're really gonna put pen to paper and figure out what right looks like. So appreciate it. Um, again, also appreciate bringing, being brief on this one and look forward to Thursday as well. Did you have some, Dennis? No. Oh, okay. Anything else? Pretty good a group? Okay, appreciate it. Now let's, uh, I think, uh, Bob, you're gonna stay on. Okay. For a loan request from uh, Hampstead Fire Company, an adoption of resolution declaring intent to reimburse expenditures with debt proceeds. And it has to do with purchasing what? Hmm. Who's on? Uh, well, we got a whole group on. We got Jennifer, Wesley, Bob, and Jim Dwyer. Okay, who's going to start this? Um, good morning, commissioners. This is Jennifer Hobbs, Bureau Chief of Accounting. Um, I think I'm going to take the lead on this for the Comptroller Department. Um, we're here today. Mr. Bob McCoy from Director of Fire and EMS is here. Mr. Jim Dwyer from president of Hampstead Fire Company and Mr. Wesley Martin, who is the treasurer from Hampstead Fire Company. Um, today, we've received an application from Hampstead Volunteer Fire Company to borrow money from the county through the low interest loan program in the amount of $5 million to be used for the construction of a new operational building for Hampstead Volunteer Fire Company. Just a brief background, the company, um, sorry, the county offers fire companies who are within the county the opportunity, if it is to their advantage, to use the county's financing program in order to borrow for their own needs. This program is primarily for capital, either building construction or um, the renovation of equipment. They do have other sources through the state, but they choose what is best in the best interest for the fire company for these loans. Uh, if this proceeds, we will work with Hampstead Fire Company as they proceed with the construction of the new operational building. We would set up the fire company loan in our next bond issue. This is a pass through debt uh, where we pass the interest rate of to the fire company which means they would receive the rate of um, our next bond issue. That will be the rate that they would pay, repay the county over the term of the loan. The term would be set for 20 years as requested for the fire company. And we usually do um, 20 years for buildings and that attaches to the repayment of the bonds because the bonds are normally a 20 year repayment for the county. 
Currently, Hampstead Fire Company has uh, one outstanding loan on equipment with a balance of $674,339.67 to be exact. Um, and are current on all of their payments. We never had any issues with repayments. Um, the fire companies know what they're able to commit to when purchasing the equipment or doing any building construction or renovations. I'm asking for the board's approval of the loan request. Approval will allow the fire company to proceed with the construction of the new operational building. Additionally, I'm requesting that the board to adopt the resolution declaring the county's official intent to reimburse expenditures with the debt proceeds. This resolution is to enable the fire company and the county to expend funds with the intention to reimburse with future proceeds in an amount of $5 million subject to requirements of any tax exempt debt issuance. Um, Mr. McCoy, Mr. Dwyer, Mr. Martin, and myself are all available for any questions the board may have. Okay, any questions? President, President uh, Dwyer, do you have any comments? Thank you for having us on this morning. The um, the fire company's current building is a uh, was constructed in 1974. The fire company's been in business since 1900. Um, in 1974, we were never had any intentions of having paid crews. Uh, therefore, the building has never been designed. It was always dual purpose with, uh, for the volunteers and for fundraising, and it never did either one really well um, because of that. Um, what we've experienced recently is um, the need to completely separate fire rescue and EMS operations from uh, all social and fundraising. Uh, the fire company, uh, I've met with the Chris Nevin, who's the mayor of the town as well, of Hampstead, um, and I've committed to him that the Hampstead Fire Company is committed to being the center of the community as much as possible. Um, so we're going to be building, the first building we're going to build is a social hall as an interim fire station that's on the rear of our property. It will act as our emergency center for one year, and we're not asking for any funding for that building from you. After that year, uh, we will um, then uh, move all the equipment to the new building and operate there and we'll convert the uh, interim building into a social hall which we will use for fundraising as a community uh, center for meetings and for um, celebrations so um, we feel very comfortable in terms of our fiscal ability to respond to this and to meet this obligation we think this is money well spent um, the new building is about 17,700 square feet. It will be a five bay drive through. Uh, it will have crew quarters that can be configured from anywhere to eight to 16 people in terms of the active crew for sleep ins. Uh, this is um, something um, that also goes along with the direction that uh, I've discussed this with uh, Director McCoy as well uh, to meet the direction that we're going in the fire service. Uh, our company intends to remain an active part of the fire service in Carroll County and to be a center of uh, services for the town of Hampstead. And I'll be glad to, I actually do have a, a graphic drawing if I can bring it up real quick. Can I share? Uh, I don't see the sharing on here. That's okay. I'll turn it to you later. You have the ability to share now. Okay. Can you see it? No, it's really small. No, <laughs> it's really small. Oh, there it is. Oh, we got it right there now. Go. We're you're good. Okay, so the fire company. This is the will be the new building. It's going to be on the same location that our current building is, but it's going to be larger. It's going to be wider, and so we have more uh, facilities for uh, training, for meetings, uh, for administrative services. Uh, the five bay drive through. If you can see in the back, the building in the back will be the uh, social hall. And that's intended to house about uh, up to 325 people for social events. Um, the uh, approach we're taking on this is not one of extravagance by any means. Uh, we're very functionally oriented, but we want to ensure crew safety and comfort, and that's what we're focused on with this. Uh, this allows us to have decon uh, areas and uh, facilities within the new building that we don't currently have. So to us, it's an investment in the fire company, it's investment in the community as well. But I'll be glad to answer any questions. 
It's uh, this is our artist rendition. If you've got any questions regarding this, we'll be glad to answer that as well. A couple of quick questions. One, one is what is the 674,000? Um, what was that used for that you're still in debt for? Oh, that we purchased a uh, new class A pumper, um, went in service January 1st, 2021. Um, that was part of our planned replacement. Uh, the engine, the engine we had there, we actually sold to new market. And, uh, and the timeline for uh, completion of uh, the social hall? Sure. So we're at the. Uh, I apologize, the operations facility. Well, no, it, it's all uh, commissioned for Ralston. It's all hooked together. So okay. we will break, planning on breaking ground in May of this year, uh, which time we will construct. The uh, interim building, we'll expect to move all the emergency operations to that new building as of November of 2021. We'll immediately begin the demolition of the existing structure for the fire station. And then a new building, we hope to be up and running with the new operations building on Main Street in town uh, by November of 2022. And the social hall will be up and running again as a social hall be converted back from the interim building uh, in the spring of 2023. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, first of all, Director McCoy, are you in agreement? Yes, Commissioners, I totally support this. It's going to secure uh, service delivery for that area for decades. Absolutely. Okay. Having seen the fire department move from the carpet, but well, presently the carpet store in Hampstead, to the new <laughs> facility and uh, what you have now of Built 74 to this is, uh, I think, a move in the right direction. With that, I move the Board of County Commissioners approve the loan request of $5 million uh, by the Hampstead Volunteer Fire and Hose Company Number 1 and adoption of the resolution declaring the county's intent to reimburse uh, expenditures for debt proceeds. Second. Okay, I have a motion on floor and second. Is, is there any further discussion? Commissioner Wentz? Hey, Jim, good to see you. Uh, hey, Wesley, hey, good, good to see you as well. Awesome. I'm fine. Thank I you. I saw a picture of us from uh, 1982 a while back, and uh, we were a lot <laughs> younger and a lot thinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I probably, had, I probably had a little bit of hair back then, too, Jim. I don't know. Hey, you know, that was the Wance was 50? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think uh, it looks like we were both about 15 at the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hey Jim, what's the total uh, the, the total cost for the entire project? Uh, Steve, you just want to know about the fire. Or you want to talk about the uh, social hall as well. But both of them. What's your what's what's the total? What once you're done, what what where are you with with money there? It's gonna be right around six million. It's uh, okay. So the uh, there's we all we have about a half a million dollars or more um, on the site work utility. Uh, water, um, stormwater management, uh, that's all got to be taken care of. That's all included in this. Um, and uh, the building in the back is going to be, um, it's about $850,000 to build the building. We have costs going back and forth to convert it to and from a uh, operations building and then back again. It's going to work very well, though, and uh, we're quite excited about it. Yeah, I think, listen, I think you guys have done an excellent job of of taking that piece of property and and putting uh, both buildings on there like that. I think I think uh, kudos to whoever came up with that uh, when the just a quick question, when the equipment responds out of the new building, will they be coming out on 30 or do they come out in the alley? It's kind of hard to tell with that rendering. Sure. Uh, on the interim basis, they'll be actually coming out on Upper Beckleysville Road. For about okay. a year they're going to come out the back and come out there and we've already worked with the town to make sure that we have the clearances for the turns and everything else right uh, okay the town's actually in the process of they're going to be widening upper beckleysville and uh, as they've done doing some road work there um after that all the equipment will come back out when the new building will be back right on route 30 again uh will be the primary exit and egress okay well done. I mean, I you know I've been through building new buildings before, as you well know, and uh, it's not easy. So, <laughs> you, you guys, uh, I I congratulate you, and I give you, I, I wish you the best. Uh, you, you guys are doing really well over there. Kudos to all of you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Any other questions I can answer? 
Any other comments, discussion? Mr. Martin, you have anything to say? You know, strong, silent type? I just write the bills and try to figure out where the money's coming in and going out. And uh, But uh, we're excited about it, and we uh, really do appreciate your, your support and also uh, Director McCoy's support on this. And uh, we look forward to working with you to uh, market that and make it a point of interest for the community to hold other things in and hopefully generate uh, some income for the county through through other projects that we have in there. Yes, sir. And again, a very good presentation. Uh, with that, let's take a vote. All in favor? It is unanimous. 5-0. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Jennifer. And let's move on to a bid approval for 2021 pipe culvert repairs. Thank Replacement you. with additional uh, alternative one and old Hanover Road. Who's on? I'll take it. Um, this is Maureen in the purchasing office. Yep. And um, we are here to ask your approval to award a contract for the pipe culvert repair and replacement to CJ Miller in the amount of $466,198.50. This work consists of repair and replacement of pipe culverts on 16 county roads. The county requested competitive sealed bids and received one response. This amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be necessary. And if you have any questions about the project, I'll turn it over to Chris Lanachin. Thank you. Um, as was said, uh, this work uh, is for 16 roadways with 30 different sites. Um, I can list all the roadways if, if you would like, um, or we can have those for the end. Um, we will be doing pipe replacements due to failures or pipes not functioning properly, uh, new pipes to address issues or property owner concerns. Uh, we'll be addressing some end walls, uh, inlets, stream maintenance, mains to traffic, and roadway patching till we get to our overlay and reclamation uh, later in the summer. Uh, this bid did include an ad alternate to complete some additional work on Old Hanover Road. The bid came in very favorable for us and we've included Old Hanover into this work. Uh, with our aging infrastructure, we need to take advantage and of the opportunity that we presented here to play catch up. Uh, so we're going to take advantage of that. Uh, we are very familiar with C.J. Miller's work, um, and we anticipate starting as soon as the weather permits uh, when this white stuff keeps falling, stops falling out of the sky. Well, according to Commissioner Wendt, it is done. So you should be able to start maybe tomorrow, but we'll see. Um, Thank you very much. It, it said it was competitive sealed bids. How long was the bid process? Was it out for two weeks or a month or how long? Do we know? Well, you do know. Just curious. <laughs> the, the, the bid process usually um, it was out probably for at least three weeks uh, because we put it out um, usually for at least a week and then we have a pre bid conference and then it's usually like a, a Two weeks after that so i would say all together it's probably it's three weeks so in other words you're very confident that the bid process was out in enough time for others that were interested in providing a sealed bid had the yes. opportunity okay definitely okay okay any other uh, questions or comments commissioner weaver we with that, I move the County Board of Commissioners award the contract for the 2021 pipe culvert repair placement uh, with add, out, add alternate one for Old Hanover Road to C.J. Miller LLC in the amount of $466,198.50. And Second. Okay, we got a motion. I'm glad you were tongue-tied on that motion as well. And we have a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? It's unanimous, 5-0. Let's Thank move you. on to uh, rehabbing the Pleasant Valley water storage tank. Okay, uh, again, we are seeking your approval to award a contract for the rehabilitation of the Pleasant Valley Water Storage Tank to Mid-Atlantic Storage Systems Incorporated of Washington, Ohio in the amount of $61,289. And again, the bid amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be necessary. 
And for questions on the project, I'll turn it over to Andy Watcher. Did we get more than one? Did we get more than one? Wait, wait, hold on a second, Andy. Commissioner Frazier? I'm sorry. Did we get more than one bid on this? No. Commissioner, this was, was viewed as a specialty type of work, and, and the same contractor who originally installed the, the, the tank is the contractor who, who, who we are reaching out to for the rehab work. So we didn't we didn't put a bid out on this? We just asked him to do the work? That is correct. Okay. Okay. Does Mid-Atlantic uh, Storage Systems have multiple water tanks in Carroll County? As far as I understand, this is is this and Bark Hill may be the the two that they installed for for us here in Carroll County. They they are a a, a well established uh, uh, firm who, who do work on, on a national basis. I, I, have, I have no doubt about the the, uh, the confidence level in their work. Okay. I mean, this is a it's a good amount of money. It's over fifty thousand dollars. Why wasn't it put out to bid? Uh, let me explain a little bit well, as far as the uh, background of those commissioners. The uh, the um, the uh, the work includes two two major uh, components. One is the actual uh, rehab work on, on the on the water storage tank itself. Um, the the cost for that portion is approximately one one half of the overall cost, and it, it includes the edge coating and caulking of the of the of all the interior and exterior pan panel seams. And believe it or not, the installation of 4,700 bolt caps and ceiling. Uh, we were also going to install some 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 an anode bars inside of the tank itself. Uh, these improvements will will uh, slow the corrosion of the tank and will extend its service life by approximately 10 years. The other half of the cost uh, associated with, with this contract is for the uh, the uh, temporary water supply system for the for, for Pleasant Valley while this work is being being performed. Um, the the, uh, the uh, downside of having the, the uh, relatively small small community of Pleasant Valley is we we essentially have one system that, that serves the, the the entire uh, area as far as water supply goes. So for the, this work to be uh, done properly, the uh, tank has to be taken offline and drained for a three to four week period. So so approximately thirty thousand dollars of, of this cost is about just to play it safe is about eight weeks worth of temporary water supply system. For, for the for the uh, community, the uh, the two groundwater wells and the treatment plant will still stay in operation. The the the, the plan for this is to uh, install a temporary uh, system uh, connected to the fire hydrant near near the fire station that 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 will include a ten thousand gallon storage tank and a pressurization system for the community. So while the cost does that, uh, it is high. Uh, one one half of that approximately is for the temporary system itself. And as far as the rehabilitation work goes, I, I believe it's it's money well spent that will that will absolutely extend the, the uh, useful service life of the water storage tank. Where where, where is this located uh, in relation to the fire department? And is this a total metal tank? It, it's a it's a metal it's an exterior metal panel tank, and the inside is glass coated. And it's located. Um, it's on High Street. It, it, it's essentially at the highest point in, in, in Pleasant Valley. It's it's about a uh, a half mile or so from from the uh, firehouse. Mr. Wayans, when you're in high school, did you go to this water tank and spray paint? You love Kathy on it. I, I appreciate the fact that you think I was in high school in 1994. Thank you so very much. <laughs> when I go to the top of the tank, Weaver, I can see your house from there. So go, going back to uh, the question Commissioner Frazier asked, and I followed up, you're saying this was not a competitive bid. Is there anything proprietary on the work that is being done on this, or is it that the, uh, the builder knows the tank best and it's in our best interest to use the same vendor for the repairs and rehab? The um, the combination of, of the vendor of, of building the, the original tank with the knowledge of how the glass the the glass line panels function, 
and 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 the history that they have of, of other re rehab type efforts similar to what's needed for for uh, this tank uh, plays a huge role in in in, in not bidding it as, as a general type of a project uh it, it's very specialty oriented and as i said previously i believe the uh, county will will gain a great deal of value with this rehab effort okay thanks Ann. <laughs> Any other questions, uh, Commissioner Wentz? No, I was gonna make the motion that we award the contract for rehabilitation of the Pleasant Valley Water Storage Tank to Mid-Atlantic Storage Systems in the amount of $61,289. Second. 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 Okay, we have a motion, we have three seconds. I think I know where this is going. No further discussion, all in favor? Okay, let's move on. Uh, let's see. We got a bid approval, uh, Springfield Avenue Engineering and Construction Management Services. Looking forward to listening to this one. Uh, Maureen and Andy, I think you're still both up. Maureen? Yes, again, we are asking your approval to award a contract for the engineering and construction management services for the replacement of the Sykesville, Maryland 851 Springfield Avenue Water and Sanitary sewer systems to Rummel, Plumper, and Call in the amount of $363,346.53. This award is being made via the competitively bid term contract. The proposal, the proposal amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be necessary. And again, I'll turn it over to Andy for questions about the project. Gentlemen, th this project is, is, is the replacement of the Springfield Avenue water and sewer systems and is the continuation of the overall capital improvement project planned and funded for the town of Sykesville as part of the overall freedom service area. This project follows the uh, Main Street water and sewer project that, that, that this board approved last year. The scope of work includes the design of replacement water and sewer service mains and laterals on the 2300 foot segment of Springfield Avenue from the intersection with Main Street and extending eastward to, to Warfield Road. The water and sewer mains and laterals date to the 1960s and 70s and have reached the, the, the limits of their expected service life. This project will directly impact approximately 32 properties. As with many of our projects, this one also, also includes a complication. In this instance, however, the complication will, will, will benefit the county and the overall work. Uh, Springfield Avenue is owned and maintained by the State Highway as Maryland 851. The state is currently exploring Springfield Avenue storm drainage system improvements via, via Rummel, Klepper, and Claw, and Call, or RK and K, which is much easier to say. In understanding the uh, critical need to coordinate the storm drainage improvements with the replacement water and sewer improvements, and with the knowledge that the county has an existing term contract in place with RK and K, the Bureau uh, the, the Bureau quickly realized the potential time and cost savings with having the same firm manage both projects. So we, we have reached out to the state highway staff to, to uh, go over this matter and obtain their, their approval to, uh, to use RK and K for our work. Uh, once that was obtained, the Bureau met with RK and K on several occasions to establish the overall scope of the project. So as far as cost savings go, a considerable amount of the survey work needed for the county's portion of the project has already been completed as part of the state's project. We, we're going to realize uh, additional cost savings by not having two separate firms coordinate the improvements and modify the, the uh, drawings for each of the projects. The um, construction plans that uh, our community will, will complete to, uh, as part of the scope of work will be the basis for the construction bid process, and we expect that to go to bid in, in, in 2022. And then finally, we, we will continue to coordinate with the State Highway with respect to the roadway repair responsibilities to Springfield Avenue. If any of you have driven Springfield Avenue recently, uh, the, the state of the roadway is in pretty bleak shape, and the state has acknowledged uh, 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 responsibilities for it, for it with respect to their, the age of their storm drainage uh, network near, near Main Street. So with that, do you have any questions for me? Andy, I, I appreciate that rundown and... Uh... You know, we are working, we, the county, are working very closely with the town, um, with the mayor and uh, town manager, along with District 7 SHA for the last year and a half, as you know. And um, 
You said it lived, uh, it lived a lifespan from the 60s and 70s. I think it lived its lifespan 10 years ago, and okay. uh, if not 15 or 20 years ago, because um, you're right, it is really broken underneath the roadway. Um, so looking forward for this, uh, this to take place. Um, I'd like to make the motion that we award a contract for engineering construction management services for the replacement of the Sykesville, Maryland 851 Springfield Avenue water and sanitary sewer systems to Rummel, Klepper, and Call LLP in the amount of $363,346.53. Second. I got a motion and a second. Are there any further discussions? Again, really good work. Hearing, seeing none. All in favor? Okay, we got 5 0. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, let's move on to having a discussion about the locust wetland purchase. We got Tom and Chris. There you are. Yep. Good afternoon, commissioners. Yes, we're here today to request your approval to participate in the purchase of a property related to one of our MPDS MS4 projects. And this project is located within one of our municipal partners jurisdiction, the town of Union Bridge. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris to give you a few details about it. Chris? Yes, good afternoon. So uh, in 2018, we identified a location in Union Bridge for a potential stormwater facility. And the facility, uh, the proposed location is on private property adjacent to Locust Avenue. Uh, and so we approached the property owner at the time, uh, the farmer who owned the property, about uh, purchasing the two acres, and he was very amenable to working with us. Um, he since, though, has sold the property to uh, Union, what, uh, Citizens UV Solar, a uh, solar company. And uh, they went through a process of a couple of years of working with the town on all of the permitting requirements and all the approvals and the agreements. Those have all now been resolved and we are ready to move forward with, um, with this project. And um, so the project requires the purchase of approximately two acres that's in uh, its floodplain, primarily floodplain area. So it has very little um, development, um, if any, uh, potential. And uh, the uh, solar company is willing to work with us. It's in their agreement with the town. So. Uh, at this point, uh, we're looking to uh, get approval to um, fund the purchase, which is $9,000, which is the appraised value of the two acres uh, with the town of Union Bridge. Mr. Hine, Mr. Devilis, thank you very much for bringing this in front of the board. This is great for the town. I don't think there's much debate or any at all on this. So I move that the Board of County Commissioners approve the payment to the town of Union Bridge $9,000 for the purchase of two acres of property from Citizens UV Solar LLC for the construction of the Locust Wetland Stormwater Facility. Second. Second. <laughs> okay, we got a motion in a couple of seconds. Is there any further discussion? Here and seeing none, all in favor? Okay, we got five. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Chris. Let's move on to open admin. The first uh, step is the approval of the closed minutes from 211 from February 11th, 21. Move to approve the minutes. Okay, we got a motion. Got second. A, got a motion and got a second approving the minutes of 211 enclosed. Any further discussion or any discussion on that? Hearing seeing none, all in favor? Okay, we got five. Is there any uh, phone calls, any public comment? I have no public comment on we, the uh, call. We got no public comment on the call. Before we go into closed for land acquisition, open admin. Um, I'd like to uh, bring up a couple of uh, thoughts in open admin as I started uh, this morning with the uh, sharing of the 500,000 that have died so far from COVID-19 uh, do believe leaders lead. And this is not about politics. It's about leadership and resource management, how we can continue to do what we do best. And that is protecting our community um, and our neighbors. I'd like to, with that said, 
uh, we're going to be going into the budget season real soon, and we're going to have to have a lot of conversations amongst us. Uh, we do have the ability, as we did during the uh, state of the county, to separate ourselves appropriately in uh, a room and still have the face-to-face -face, uh, discussions. So I'd like to uh, have that conversation moving forward, getting us all, five of us, either in the Reagan room or up here, uh, you know, in 300, having in the, uh, on the dais, we have room for three on the dais and then the two uh, where Roberta and Tim would sit, um, you know, as we're going into the budget. Um, any challenges with that? I mean, I think, I think it's the right thing to do. I think it's a, a step towards normalcy. Uh, and I think we get a whole lot more out of it than the effects we're having on virtual. Any comments or thoughts? I think it's a good idea for us all to come together, especially for the budget. It just works much better that way. We can still social distance. We have barriers up up here. If we're going to go downstairs like we have in the past, we can certainly be spread out enough to do everything that we need to do. As long as we have our mask on in the building and so forth, I think everything will be just fine. I agree with you. It's time to, you know, I think we do the budget. We social distance, wear the masks and whatever, we'll be fine. Okay. I have to say, if, if you truly want normalcy, you have to get rid of the mask. I will not be coming into the building with a mask. We, well, we can't get rid of the masks. I mean, the masks are mandated, and uh, I mean, yeah, we're just like going into any public uh, facility, you know, it's, we, we don't have a choice. And you know, we're not in a position to make a choice. Um, we are in a position to adhere to the state and federal guidelines, um, but we cannot go less than what's already been provided by the state. We can only go more, and we know that. So what we said we would do uh, was adhere to the state uh, directives, uh, executive orders and uh, guidelines presented um, as soon as they'd come out. So if the governor does come out at 2.30 and uh, lessens those guidelines regarding masks, right. then we can put that in. But the expectation is he will not. So uh, yeah, we, don't, we are not at liberty to say we will go less than what the state has already provided. Um, you know, that's where we're at. So, um, I mean, it's a personal choice that you have to make, but you know, the value of us coming together uh, to work through the budget, I think is important, but again, it's not me, it's, it's us. So um, anybody else on that? Commissioner Wance? Yeah, I, listen, I, just as it was pointed out today that the only obligation that our General Assembly has is to do the budget one of the most important things, if not, well, it is the most important thing that we do is our budget. And I think with the uh, challenges that we're gonna see with this budget, I mean, you know, we heard two presentations today that are gonna, gonna be extremely challenging, the, the body-worn cameras and fire and EMS. And all of those include internal positions that we are gonna have to look at extremely hard. And I believe the best way to do that is to be able to, to see one another uh, in person. Eric, I, I understand what you're, wh where, where you're coming from, from a personal standpoint. Uh, I can assure you that for me, it's about respect for my coworkers when I come in here. Uh, when we're in a room together, we don't have to wear the masks, obviously. We're, we're gonna be able to talk to one another in the room as long as we're socially dis distanced or, or plexiglassed or what have you. But when you're moving from, from room to room, I think it's just a matter of respect until such time that, that folks are, are able to, to, to do less with the mask. But I quite frankly, after hearing from a lot of the professionals, because now there's a lot of debate on, well, if you get the shot, do you have to keep doing the social distance? Do you have to keep washing your hands? Well, common sense tells me, and you know how I rule, I rule with common sense a lot. Common sense tells me that we're gonna have to keep doing that for a long time. So look, 
I just think it's really important uh, to have the face-to-face, -face, and th it doesn't mean a parade of people coming in here. We can still have the, the budget presentations by the departments and agencies virtual, but I think it's important for us as the leaders of this county to be t together, even if it's a half a mile apart from one another here in, in a room. I just feel like we'll be able to do and make decisions much better. So I applaud the efforts. I know it's going to be a little bit challenging with the, the virtual aspect of it. Uh, but so far, uh, Chris Swam and his, his guys have really stepped up to help with that. And I know that they'll find a way to do this. So I just really feel it's a matter of respect that we, that we make this happen. I, 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 and I appeal to you to, 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 to go to that area and find your, your way to do that. Okay, any further discussion on it? Okay, so starting with the budget, uh, we will be meeting together uh, and we will determine whether it's up here or down in Reagan room, uh, whatever is best. Uh, that will allow us to maintain live broadcast and continue to be transparent as we are and see everybody eye to eye, whether it's through Pepsi class or not, um, <laughs> but we'll get through it. Um, we, we started talking to the other uh, open admin piece I just want to bring up and then hand it off is uh, we started talking about organization and organizational charts and how uh, we look in being effective and efficient within uh, Carroll County government to serve our community and Commissioner Wentz, uh, you're you're 100 percent, you know, correct in my view that our priority is the budget, is resource management, time, people, and money, and uh, so ensuring that we have the organization aligned with time, people, and money uh, to most effectively and efficiently run our county is important. In order for us to have these discussions about organization, uh, it needs to be open. It needs to be transparent, uh, using that word a couple times, I apologize, but it needs to be open and communi communicate amongst us and allow others who have views to communicate to us. Um, so it's not personnel specific, it's organization specific. So uh, my recommendation is we either do it during open admin or we carve out time uh, during a session and we have that open candid conversation uh, amongst us. Either way, I think works. Um, if it's on the agenda to have the open discussion, I expect we will have higher viewership of interest uh, to that specific topic um, or we just do it during open admin and we, we carve out time during open admin. But I think it's a uh, it's important enough because we all started talking about it <clears throat> um, with a couple, you know, with a couple of folks leaving as a catalyst. But we all started talking about the organization. So, if there's any thoughts on that, um, and and you know, the answer may be we're rolling, we're doing really well. Why mess up something that's working really well? And that's, you know, but that that may be the result. Uh, but I think it's fair enough to say, let's take a look at it. So any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. No, I, I, go ahead, Eric. Thank you. I, I applaud your efforts on this, but I think it'd probably be best if we wait until we got through the budget process, because I think any type of adjustments in organization we do would probably be after the budget process. And I, I think what the impetus for me with getting involved in this and supporting you on this initiative is for us to accumulate a greater understanding throughout the course of the year leading up to the budget. So I'd really like, I want us to focus in on the budget right now. And once we get through the budget, then we can try to address this. Cause I think whatever we come out of this with is going to be exponentially helpful for each and every one of us to understand different portions of the budget as we go into the next budget. And that's just how I feel about it. I applaud your initiative. Okay. Yeah, you know, continuously looking at structures, nothing nothing wrong with that. However, you know, that structure is part of the budget. 
uh, you might want to look at it as we're going through that or basically at the same time because, uh, you know, ch change there does affect how we uh, are going to look into the budget uh, in the long run. But, yeah, I, I think we need to just carve some time out and session there and um, look at some different areas uh, that was in our structure. That's uh, And uh, Steve pointed out earlier, you know, we are talking about uh, public safety quite a bit here and it's going to affect our budget. I think personnel and that is going to be a big part of it. Uh, yes, I think uh, we, we have to discuss this in open session and start uh, throwing options out. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I agree with both Eric and, and Dick. I agree with both of you. I, I think a holistic approach here is, is very important because it, I don't think it's anybody. It, it's, it's no mystery that a lot of what we're going to be doing in the next three months, two and a half, uh, is going to be personnel driven, uh, which which I don't know that that well I don't think I've been through a budget like that. Dick and Dennis, I don't never never I don't think has a has a budget been so uh, dependent on personnel. And I think this one is going to be. Uh, so I, I'd like to take, I don't think we have to spend a whole lot of time on it. I, I, I really don't. I, maybe if it ain't broke, don't fix it routine here would come into play. I do think there could be some tweaks that can be made. Uh, so maybe a, a, maybe a session before budget, but then include it in budget too. That's why I agree with both of you, Eric and, and Dick, because I think, yeah, let's 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 do it both ways. Let's sit down, have a chance to look at it holistically, uh, and then go into budget with maybe a little bit better understanding. But uh, that'll help us too when we do get to identifying where these personnel positions are most strongly going to be needed. Uh, gosh, you know, we heard from Jim today, Deweese, nine over there. How many would Brian need if we do body cameras? How many folks are we going to need internally to do fire and EMS? Risk management, HR, payroll, uh, you know. So I think it's important to, as you say, Commissioner Rothstein, look at it holistically in a session. It might only take an hour. Who knows? But at least look at it. It'll give us a chance to refresh our memories on who's where. And then I think include that in the budget and off we go. That's my two cents. Since we're talking about budget, I'll make it two cents. <laughs> uh, that, uh, Commissioner Frazier, any comment on it? I, I don't think I've ever said this. I agree with everything you said before me. Uh, we need to talk, we need to look at this. We need to do it in open session. I think a, a workshop or something before we get to the actual budget would be very, very helpful. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else for open? I do want to make a comment. Yes, sir. Um, there was a comment, I, and actually, I think it was more than a comment made at the in the last board of ed meeting about where the county is coming out so well ahead uh, financially this year, m much better than we thought we were, and we're looking okay. But you also have to remember a couple of things were brought up today, which already been mentioned: the body cameras, the fire and EMS. Uh, adding personnel because of those things into our own s structure. It's not looking as bright and rosy as you might look from the outside saying, oh, they got this extra money. We do have a lot of these other considerations to look at as well. So why I'm very optimistic that, you know, it's very nice that we didn't turn out as, as poorly as we thought we were during the COVID pandemic, and which is not over yet, by the way. But we have these other budget constraints to look at First, and, and you know we can't just say we have the extra money and we're and I know the school board voted to to ask for additional funding, which is fine, but we have to be realistic when we're doing this. We have these other things coming up, and everything has to be considered at the same time. Just just throwing it out there. It looks like we have extra money, but I don't think we actually do. Okay. Anything else for open admin before we go into close for land acquisition? Okay, I'm gonna need a motion to go into close for land acquisition. And then after that, a motion to adjourn. Motion to go into close for land acquisition. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor going into land acquisition? 
Motion to adjourn after line acquisition. Second. Second. Okay, we got a couple of seconds on that as well. All in favor to adjourn after land acquisition or after closed. Okay, we will go back into open. <laughs> uh, we will go back into open on Thursday at 0900. With that, thanks. Let us know when we're off. <laughs>